Here's, uh, hang on a second. Okay. And um, <clears throat> the following folks, the panelists are having trouble getting in. Um, yeah. Uh, not to worry, uh, Tara Das is asking if we can elevate some people who are going to be presenting on the last um, agenda item um, to panelists. We can totally do that, but don't worry about that yet because we will not be getting to that agenda item for a while. And for folks who are on the call uh, for particular agenda items which are not yet presenting, uh, you can feel free, you're welcome to stay and keep your video on. Uh, you're also welcome to kill your video and have this on in the background uh, until your item comes up. I understand that while it's all really interesting, it may not necessarily be interesting to you. And I will not be at all offended if you would like to just sort of be here for the item that you're presenting and not necessarily for the other things. So with all of that in mind, I'm going to briefly share my screen so that we can see the agenda. And we have quorum, Liz. Daryl just came in. Yeah, I see that Daryl is here and we now have quorum. Um, I promise you, I was playing a, a solitaire earlier while I was on the phone with my insurance company. I will not be playing solitaire during this meeting. Do not be fooled by the fact that it was on my, uh, my screen when I went to share screen. It's, it's, it's um, minimized and I promise you, no solitaire will be played during this meeting or at least not by me. So uh, we have, the, uh, as you see, we've got a pretty long agenda. Um, we'll have our usual programming updates from cultural and Friends of Parks organizations. And as always, raise your hand and I'll call on you in the order in which your hand has been raised and you will have a minute and a half or two at most to make your comments. Um, I, then we have a brief update from Danny Hernandez, our interim acting Northern Manhattan Parks Administrator. We'll have a presentation from the Central Parks Conservancy on work that they're doing in Community District 12. We'll have a report from Christopher Amy. Am I pronouncing your last name correctly? You are. Thanks, Liz. Excellent. Uh, from Christopher Amy on the uh, Dykeman Pier and Waterfront renovation. Um, I want to clarify that there was an error when the agenda went out. Uh, Chris will be making the presentation on the Dykeman Pier and Waterfront renovation, not on the Central Park Conservancy. Uh, I think he might have been a little bit thrown by that typo on an earlier draft of the, um, of the agenda. Then we're going to have a presentation on the proposed renovation of the Lily Brown Playground. That is a rezo item. And then we will have a presentation by NYC EDC on the new parks to be constructed at Academy Street and the North Cove. That is not a rezo item because they will not be presenting the final plan. They will be presenting, uh, giving a high level presentation of the direction in which the plan will be going based on all of the feedback and input from the uh, many public uh, sessions that were had over the winter and spring. So with that, I'm going to end the share screen because I think people like being able to see each other in the gallery. And why is it not stopping? the share. There we go. All right. In terms of brief updates and announcements, um, our resolution from last month on 1% for parks and 1% for arts, I'm pleased to report, but not surprised to report, that it passed unanimously with 36 votes and two members abstaining, uh, two members not voting due to conflict. Uh, one works for the Parks Department, one works for the City Council. Uh, we had last week, a, we participated in a fantastic, just fantastic 175th anniversary event 
for the high bridge, the city's oldest bridge. It's got the Brooklyn Bridge beat by, I don't know, like a quarter of a century, something like that. Um, it was a great presentation. The weather was fantastic. We were on the fence, the planning committee, as to whether to have the big event on the 6th or on the 7th. I'm so glad that we had it on the 6th when the air quality was perfectly fine because we all know what happened on the 7th. Uh, the event, I, I, you know, I'm pretty sure the event would have had to have been canceled because there's no way we could have had all those people outside breathing that garbage that passed for air last week. Um, Community Board 12 showed up with lots of cookies as a refreshment for the throngs and everybody really appreciated that. Um, but it was really a terrific event. And if there is anybody uh, within hearing distance of my voice who has not been on the high bridge or up the high bridge tower, you should really do yourself a favor and go do both of those things because they're awesome. And I do not use that word lightly. Um, the Hispanic Society uh, Museum and Library strike is over. It was settled. Um, seems that in the way of union negotiations and agreements, I, I think everybody is a little happy and everybody is a little unhappy, which tells me that that was probably the right thing. Um, but I, I don't have a lot of specifics about it, but I do know the museum is now open, which makes me very happy. Uh, and last night there was a great concert as uh, one of the Noma Art Stroll events. Um, <clears throat> earlier today, when I was walking in Fort Tryon Park, I happened to bump into the two people who are the restaurateurs behind the new contract, the new, um, concession that is going into the restaurant space in Fort Tryon Park. They are working hard on the space. Apparently there was a gas leak and there was really much more than expected um, leftover stuff from the previous concessionaire. So that's all going a little bit more slowly than anybody uh, would like, but it is going and they anticipate opening up um, by September, they might have a soft opening a little bit earlier, but it will not, they will be missing, you know, most of the summer, but they did unearth the um, takeout window, so which had been covered up by the previous contractor by, I don't know, a refrigerator or something. So that is a service that they will uh, be looking to provide at some point when they do open, probably next year. Um, so that's exciting. Uh, and lastly, thank you so much to Danny for his very quick response uh, to a question that I had earlier today based on some public outreach about the sprinklers at the Javits playground. They weren't on. I asked Danny why not. He gave me a really solid answer that made a lot of sense. He's working on getting them back on. Uh, they may actually already be back on, and if not, they'll be back on tomorrow. Love that. So, you know, you had really big shoes to fill with Jennifer uh, going, but you um, you appear to be filling them quite well. So we miss Jennifer, but thank you, thank you, thank you for uh, being really good at your job. So second that, Liz. We are we are just so lucky uptown. So thank you for that. Um, third that. Excellent, excellent. Um, all right. So with that, uh, does anybody have questions or are we good with proceeding to the programming updates? All right. Oh, you know what? And I forgot to make my notes about when I called this to order. What time did we do that? I was like 6.33. Okay. Yeah, do we adopt the, the agenda yet, right? We don't adopt the agenda. Uh, this is this is an authoritarian regime. No, I'm just kidding. I, I send it out. Adopting the agenda isn't a requirement at the committee level. We sort of do that through consensus prior to the meeting and then the agenda is what the agenda is, but that's why I shared it so that everybody knows what it is because I would not want anyone to think that I have a hidden agenda. Um, Copy. Bad puns, yes. Hidden agenda, no. So, all right. Uh, 
So I am going to, um, just taking a quick look through the chat and reminding everybody that the chat is really only used for sort of administrative clarification. If people are throwing questions in there, uh, according to the open meetings law, I'm obligated to read them aloud so that they are part of the record. Um, and Chris Heitman is saying uh, with some enthusiasm that the Javits sprinklers are back on. So I'm guessing he is a member of the public who is uh, pleased with that development as am I. Um, Danny, yes, you can sign up to make an announcement, but since you are a committee member, I'm going to defer to all the members of the public who will be making announcements and then I'll call on you last. Not because I don't love you, I do, but I feel like I should give the members of the public first crack at that. Uh, so without further ado, Jason Smith. Um, oh, and for people who are making announcements about whatever their organization is, if you could do me the kindness of shooting me a quick email with a summary of your comments, it makes minute taking so much easier because then I just cut and paste it, put it in the minutes. I would appreciate it. My email is Liz Ritter, R I T T E R, dot C B 12 M at gmail.com. Jason from NYRP, what you got for us? Hey, good evening, everyone. Can you hear me all right? Yes. Great. Uh, thanks so much, Liz. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm the director of Northern Manhattan Parks for NYRP. We help out the Parks Department taking care of a few parks on the east side of Inwood and Washington Heights, Sherman Creek, Northern High Bridge, and the Harlem River Greenway. I'm here tonight primarily to update the group to uh, a project we recently kicked off to engage the community and a variety of partners in brainstorming, uh, studying Sherman Creek Park and doing some analysis leading to what we hope will be a conceptual design for some restoration and the Sherman Creek Inlet. Uh, that is, um, for those of you who don't know the geography of Sherman Creek Park, uh, just south of Academy Street, um, just north of PS5, the public school. Um, it's a site that is, uh, we think, a great opportunity to do ecological improvement to the area. And we um, are trying to have as broad a conversation as possible with the neighborhood because we think it's a great time to think a little bit about how we can enhance <clears throat> natural resources in Inwood, especially the wetlands, and, and try to do some thinking about how to preserve or enhance those um, resources while adapting to climate change and sea level rise, which we're worried is really gonna impact the east side of Inwood, particularly the Dykeman houses and surrounding properties um, amongst the first areas in our region. Um, sorry, that was a mouthful. I know I only have one minute, um, so I'll go as quickly as I can, but uh, the next step in this process is um, uh, a, a second meeting of a committee we put together called the Project Advisory Council. And um, if anyone is interested in, in joining or participating in that, the meeting is on June 28th, four, uh, 3 to 4.30. And I'll put uh, an email in the chat if that's the best way, Liz can maybe tell me um, to communicate to the group how to engage. Um, and then there's a, a broader kind of public conversation that we're hosting on July 15th, which is City of Water Day. There's a lot of events happening on the waterfront around the city, but MRP will be hosting events and public conversations in Sherman Creek, um, including a bird watching tour, shoreline cleanup, and several different opportunities to provide input and engage in a conversation about what we'd like to see happen on the Sherman Creek Inlet. And that's gonna be in the afternoon of July 15th um, at Sherman Creek Park. And those, um, uh, maybe Liz, after I'm done, you can tell me the best way to, to share details. And I'll certainly include them in an email I send you for the minutes. Thank you all very much. You're on mute, Liz. Thank you. I muted myself because there was some very loud traffic going over. Um, thank you, Jason, for that uh, report, and you um, were able to, you were in just on the right time, so thank you for that. Um, do me a favor, Jason, 
if you could, well, actually, I'm going to type something. Um, I'm not always clear on who sees what. I know that panelists can see the Q&A. Excellent. Okay, so if you, Jason, if you have some information you want to broadcast to the entire, everybody in attendance, if you go to the webinar chat, and toggle on the pull down menu in the two field, toggle it to everyone, then whatever information you're sharing about your contact, the date and time of your event, what have you, will be visible not only to the panelists, um, but also to all of the attendees. So that would go for everybody uh, who is making, any of the um, panelists who are making announcements that the general public uh, that are intended for the general public. Um, next up, and if anybody is, um, any of the attendees would like to uh, present, uh, they don't need to throw it into the webinar chat, they can just raise their hands. Next up, we have Ian Caddick from Rowe, New York. Thanks, Liz, can you hear me okay? Yes. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to uh, let you know that Row New York still has space left for our youth summer rowing camp. Uh, no experience was necessary, so this would be a good opportunity to get introduced to the sport. If you know anybody who might want to uh, get a feel for rowing. Uh, the first of our four summer sessions begins June 20th. Um, students coming from households earning below uh, $100,000 can participate at no cost. Um, each session is two weeks long and runs Monday through Friday from 10.30 to 12.30 p.m., so two hours. Uh, you can visit our website at rowneyork.org for more details and to register. Thanks. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, and in case you're wondering, I promise I'm not playing solitaire. The me being distracted is me taking notes and looking at my other screen. Uh, next up, we have Catherine Hughes from the Morris Janelle Mansion. Hi, Liz and everybody. We have some events coming up at the Morris Jamel Mansion. Uh, one is a big dinner that we have not had since the pandemic. It's the George Washington dinner commemorating a dinner that he had with his new cabinet in 1790 on our site. That is July 9th from six to nine. And you can find out more on our website at www.morrisjumel.org. We also have two movies happening outside in the park this summer on July 6th from uh, at dusk, you can come and see Vivo. Um, and that is going to be shown by Inwood Artworks and they will come back again August 3rd uh, to show Encanto. So those two movies will be happening this summer out in the park it is all for free, so uh, please go to our website. You can find out more information about our programming, but that is the most immediate happening this summer. Great, thank you. Uh, next up, we have Julie McCoy from... Inwood Canoe Club. Yes, from the Inwood Canoe Club. I distracted myself by trying to do two things at once. We, we all live that life, Liz. Thank you. Thank you very much. So uh, I'm Julia McCoy. I'm the Commodore of the Inwood Canoe Club, New York City's oldest continually operating paddle sport club in, well, in New York. Um, we are at the beginning of our summer season and we have a lot of activities, including some community activities. As always, we have Sunday mornings from about 10 o'clock to noon, show up by 9.45 if you want to be on the first wave, our free walk-up public programming. We will put you into a kayak with a life jacket and a paddle and take you on a short trip. If you're not up to the trip, it's absolutely 100% okay to tootle around in front of the boathouse on the water uh, or just come with your family and enjoy the view. So again, that's Sunday mornings, uh, 10 to 12, 
We have put out about 140 people since Memorial Day weekend, and we have 12 more weekends to go. Uh, we have also had some youth programs, uh, which have been organized by our youth pro programming affiliate of Town Paddling. Uh, in particular, we've had sessions with Cat Rock, which is an outreach program by the Sierra Club. Um, they've actually had three sessions with us where we teach them how to paddle, and every time they come back, they get better. Uh, last, not last, but two weeks ago, Friday the 2nd, we hosted an event by New Alternatives, which is an advocacy organization for homeless LGBTQ youth. We had some wonderful young people uh, show up and have a, a fun paddle that Friday, and we hope to work with them again in the future. Uh, we do have coming up on uh, Father's Day, which is June 18th, uh, we have our open house program as usual. We will also be hosting a Girl Scout troop for a uh, sort of a, it's some people are calling it the daddy daughter paddle um, for them to come out and have a little paddling trip, um, girls with their dads on Father's Day. Uh, we will have more, and I will be back here next month to keep you all appraised. Um, I do uh, one more mention, and I will put a sign up link. We will be doing a shoreline cleanup. Uh, both the Inwood Canoe Club and Friends of Inwood Hill Park. That is Saturday, June 24th, 10.30 to 1. Uh, I'll paste that in shortly. And you can sign up there. Tickets are free. Uh, come help clean up the shoreline. People like it. It's uh, You'd be surprised. That's it. That's my report. Cool. Thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, next up, we have uh, Natalie Estino from the Hispanic Society Library and Museum. Hello folks, buenas tardes. Uh, this is Natalie, head of education, academic and community programs at the Hispanic Society Museum and Library that uh, has uh, reopened finally after many years, its main court space and uh, our treasured uh, Sorolla Gallery showing the murals of the vision of Spain. I'm here to just update you that uh, we, we did have a very successful event yesterday in collaboration with NOMA, one of the Monday out, free outdoor uh, concerts. Unfortunately, the weather didn't let us have it outdoors, but having it in uh, the vision of Spain gallery is uh, not too shabby as plan B's go. There's, yeah. yeah, and so I I will say that uh, we are uh, relaunching our weekly highlights tours, tours at two, I will put the link into your chat uh, for you to sign up. These will be happening starting this Saturday the 17th, but then moving forward will be every Friday and Saturday. Uh, so catching some weekday folks that want to play hooky from work and come uh, come hang out in our gallery spaces, and uh, as well as our regular Saturday folks. This Saturday, we also have a nice welcome back to the terrace and uh, well launching of the summer season in collaboration with Mano a Mano, Mexican Culture Without Borders. Uh, it is, uh, so we will have the performer, Linda Epo, anybody who attended our Dia de los Muertos event in October heard her singing and she's extraordinary. We will also have art making, face painting, and uh, a Mexican folk art sales table. This will all be taking place on our upper terrace, which is now accessible via a wheelchair lift. And uh, we uh, hope that you guys can come uh, make some art. This is intergenerational for folks of any age uh, and come and see the um, uh, Sorolla room, some Sorolla portraits that are in the main space in uh, commemoration of the centenary of the artist passing, as well as a sneak behind the scenes sneak preview of the midpoint installation of the uh, Jesus Rafael Soto's penetrable installation that is going on to the upper terrace uh, and will be on view by the end of June. Cool, thank you. All right, uh, next up we've got uh, Danny 
Bonilla, who I imagine is going to be giving us some information about the ring. Yes, hi. Um, I am uh, speaking on behalf of the Ring Garden um, for a show that we have every year called Art in the Gardens. Uh, come one, come all. Join us as we celebrate our local artists. We will have artworks by visual artists, painters, sculptors, poets, singers, dancers, photographers from the Inwood and Washington Heights area. It's uh, this Saturday at at 12 to 5 at the in at the at the Ring Garden, by Lieutenant William Thai uh, Triangle. Um, and let me see. Uh, this is also part of the uh, 2023 Uptown Art Stroll. So um, I hope to see everyone out over there. Cool. Thank you. Sounds like a packed, uh, packed Saturday. And the rain date on that is Sunday? Yeah, the rain date is on June 18th, just in case it rains this Saturday. Okay, cool. Thank you. Um, next up, Alexis, Classical Theater of Harlem. Yes, hi, everybody. Sorry, I need a new computer, so you're going to have to look at Telly Savalas. But <laughs> okay. So, again, we are starting, um, we start previews. Um, July 7th, um, and we will have uh, a pre-show uh, uh, with, um, I'm sorry, Jazzmobile. July 8th, we are presenting the world premiere, Malvolio, written by um, uh, Betty Shamia. It is an original sequel to Twelfth Night. Uh, it will prove to be amazing. Um, I will put the link to our website in the chat. And uh, we are doing a variety of community um, events as well, outreach events. We're working with Summer Youth Employment, uh, Touro College, Columbia Dental. But um, the one thing that I can solidly confirm and encourage everyone, which I'll also put in the chat, um, we are having the uh, American Italian Cancer Society uh, from nine to five on July 5th, uh, we'll be doing free breast cancer screenings for people with no insurance, under insurance, Medicaid, Medicare, any kind of insurance. Um, if you have insurance, your copay will be absorbed by American Italian Cancer Society. And if you have no or uh, limited insurance or and, and or resources, if God forbid they find something, they will uh, organize your continuum of care for free. Cool. Thank you. Um, I will say one thing that probably most people don't know about the Italian American Cancer Foundation uh, that I know because I did have my last mammogram through them in December is that when they do the screening, you get not only a complete examination and a mammogram, you also get pasta. I kid you <laughs> not. It is the Italian American Cancer Foundation. They are apparently co-sponsored by DiCecco and you get pasta. I love that. <laughs> yeah, they're really great. great. It's pasta. Um, thank you for that. Uh, Naima. What you got? Oh no! Wait, sorry. Uh, next up, we had we had uh, Domingo is in front of Naima, and then we have Naima. It's okay, Liz. Something from uh, Uplift. At, no, no, it's you know we we do things in turn. Okay, I'm ready. Uh, yeah. So um, we've been working on on Fort George Playground. Uh, this summer is our fourth summer after we rehab that location, uh, where we'll have 210 uh, youth particip uh, youth uh playing uh for free so um come check it out for george's right next to michael music we'll be there saturdays all day um and yeah let's keep these kids off the street outstanding and by playing i assume you mean basketball of course we're not gonna play soccer right liz you have whenever you see me talk about soccer i just you know i know that but not everybody else knows that so you know we want Thank to be you, what kind of ball we're talking about. Okay. Um, not, uh, what time on Saturdays? We're there all day from like 10 to like 5. 
Okay, fantastic. Thank you so much. Uh, Naima. Thank you, Liz. Hi, everyone. Um, I just wanted to share an, invit an invitation for Juneteenth coming up. Uh, there's going to be a movie night. First and foremost, I will put the information on the chat so that folks can have it logistically. Um, and it'll have a link to the flyer. So if you want the details, you'll have it. But basically, there's going to be a movie night on Juneteenth, which is Monday, June 19th. And it will take place at uh, the restaurant and lounge called Brazier, which is on 10th Avenue. Uh, the guest speaker will be Carol Mulligan. She is um, she's a beloved educator from uptown who grew up in the Jim Crow South. Um, her her grandparents are actually um, slave owners and also uh, children of slaves. So she has a very um, interesting background and we'll be able to dialogue with her as we reflect on Juneteenth. So this is just an open invitation to the community for a movie night. We will be watching the movie Harriet based on the life of Harriet Tubman. So I'll I'll share that information with you, Liz, and I'll share it on the chat as well. It's Monday, June 19th, 6.30 p.m. The restaurant is called Brazier, and the address is 472 West 202 Street with 10th Avenue. Thank you. Uh, I am very sorry to miss that. I'm going to be out of town because Juneteenth is also my daughter's birthday. So. Um, well, happy birthday to her as well. <laughs> my Juneteenth baby. Um, all right, seeing no other hands, I'm going to go last with an announcement from um, Martin Collins for NOMA. Uh, the 21st uh, Uptown Art Stroll continues with scores of exhibitions, events, and open studios through June, June 30th in Washington Heights, Inwood, and West Harlem. Go to their website. Uh, N-O-M-A-A-N-Y-C dot org for the online calendar. Printed guides are available on the ground floor at the NOMA offices in the United Palace, which might still be closed while the Tonys are loading out. Who knows? Um, can't believe, by the way, I forgot to make that announcement. What is wrong with me? Hello, the Tonys in Washington Heights. How awesome was that? Okay, back to live programming. Um, you get your printed guides for the for the art stroll. They are at the United Palace and also in four dozen locations throughout uptown. You can see the website for a complete listing. Everyone is invited to the closing reception for the Women in the Heights exhibition with 51 artists, uh, including me. Um, and the Uptown Art Stroll closing June 29th from 6 to 9 p.m. at the United Palace. Arrive early to see Goddesses at the Palace, a site-specific art installation by Andrea Arroyo that transforms the United Palace grand foyer with a series of large-scale artworks inspired by the theater's history and architecture, and stay for the reception with complimentary hors d'oeuvres and refreshments, and not to mention so many uptown neighbors. The opening reception was really delightful, and I'm sure the closing reception will be as well. Um, and Daryl, do you have a, is that a question or do you have an announcement? Uh, it's more of an announcement. Okay. So didn't get to the thing in time. Uh, and apologize not being on camera, I'm having connectivity issues. Uh, but just real quick, if in case people don't know, nothing specific to the neighborhood, but I did want to remind people that it is LGBTQ Pride Month. Uh, we are surrounded by pride. Bronx Pride is uh, uh, later this week and this weekend. And uh, Harlem Pride is the last Saturday in June. And uh, New York City Pride, the big parade, March is on the last Sunday in June, this year, June 25th, downtown. Excellent. Thank you. And if anyone wants to march, let me know. I might have an in. Fantastic. I'm actually, I'm already marching with Jamani. So I will see, I will see you at Pride. Thank I'll you. likely be done by two o'clock, which I'm very happy about. <laughs> oh, well, you know, what are you marching up front? Uh, 
<laughs> Carol, I might reach out. I, I may reach out. Please do. Very good. Fantastic. If you've never, if you've never marched in pride, it's almost as well, you know, marching in pride, going on the high bridge. They're very different experiences. I recommend them both. Um, okay, it is 7.07 .07, and I wanna turn the mic over to Danny Hernandez to uh, give us some updates on what is happening in all things parks. Good evening, everybody. And I'm happy to join you all, thank you. Um, I just wanna start off by saying thank you to everyone, uh, many members in this board, uh, members of the community, thank you for the support. Um, with my return and everything, um, it, it really means a lot to me, and I appreciate it. I'm humbled by the by the support and and the kind words that everyone shares with me when they see me. And uh, I'm committed to the service, and I'm happy to be a part of hopefully providing clean, safe parks in which we all can enjoy. Um, but an update of what we have going on in Northern Manhattan: uh, we have a slew of a host of uh, of events that are sponsored by a council member, Carmen De La Rosa. Um, on June 16th, we have a skate night at Ann Loftus Playground in Fort Tryon Park from 4 p.m. to 7 p.m. Um, on June 17th as well, sponsored by our council member, Carmen De La Rosa, we have uh, on the 17th from 12 p.m. to 3 p.m., we have a summer festival at Ann Loftus Playground in Fort Tryon Park as well. And quiet as kept, hopefully Miss Jennifer Hopper is down the bus, is also acting as almost like a, a farewell to Miss Jennifer Hopper. Um, in Northern Manhattan. Uh, on the 17th as well, we have Immigrant History Festival say, taking place at uh, Dykeman Farmhouse to celebrate history and our present day culture. And that's at 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. As well as at the uh, Dykeman Farmhouse, we have a Scouts and Soldiers, Native Americans and the Colonial Militias and Wars from the 1750 through 1780s. Um, on the 24th from 12 p.m. to 2 p.m. as well as at the Dykeman Farmhouse. Um, we had several uh, very large, wonderful events, ones at Drums Along the Hudson at uh, Inwood Hill Park on June 4th that just passed. That went great, I believe, and uh, seemed like everybody enjoyed. Um, it was great to see many of you folks over at the uh, 175th anniversary of the historic High Bridge Pedestrian Bridge. That was a wonderful celebration as well. And it was good to see many of you guys and, and meet everybody in person. Um, we have a uh, exciting opening day ceremony that's taking place for the upcoming pool season at uh, High Bridge Park um, on June 28th, 11 a.m. Um, everyone's invited to help us uh, ceremonial, ceremonially uh, open up the pool season, kick it off. Um, in addition to that, we have a uh, recurring programming, uh, which is uh, Forest Fitness on Tuesdays and Thursdays at Fort Tryon Park from 7.30 to 8.30, as well as Saturdays from 8.30 to 9.30 a.m. We have also New York Roadrunners Open Run at Inwood Hill Park on Saturdays from 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. Uh, we have uh, Saturday's Trail Work uh, and Bike Share, second Saturday of every month at Highbridge Park from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. at the BMX Jump Park at Fort George Avenue. Uh, Broadway Beautification Days, 2 p.m., um, second and fourth Saturdays, 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. at Fort Tryon Park. Sunday Stewardship Days as well at Fort Tryon Park, third Sunday of every month from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. And what Ms. Uh, Liz Ritter just spoke about, if you guys haven't had a chance to tour the Highbridge Water Tower, they have the High Bridge Water Tower Tour with our Urban Park Rangers on the first Sunday and third Saturday of every month from 1 p.m. to 3 p.m. at High Bridge Park's Water Tower Terrace located on 174th off of Amsterdam Abbey on the backside of the pool. Um, Sunset Yoga is also available for the public on Wednesdays, Wednesday evenings, 6.45 to 8 p.m. at Abbey's Lawn on Fort Tryon Park. I also would like to share that uh, Northern Manhattan has a new team member. We have Mr. Christopher Heitman, who has recently joined us as Deputy Administrator for Northern Manhattan Parks, and he's been a wonderful addition. And uh, I look forward to working with him and providing a service to the public. And he's on the call as well today. 
Thank you. Thank you. Um, question. So are you interim acting or are you the permanent uptown admi uh, In administrator? Interim acting for the transition period. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, keep us posted on how the rest of that is going. Um, I hope you're going to send me all of that in an email because I was typing really fast, but that was a lot. Um, <laughs> and I do actually want to remind people something that you had announced last month um, and some of them have happened already. Oh, no, I was going to say the Scandia concerts, but in fact, they have all happened. So they happened. Yes. No need to announce those. Um, OK, I see a raised. Is that an old hand, Naima, or is that a question? I have a question for Mr. Hernandez. OK. Um, Mr. Hernandez, I, I have a, a quick question. I guess it's two parts. Um, in terms of the skating event that's going to be happening, you mentioned that it was sponsored by the council member or city council. The, the skating equipment, is that provided by NYC Parks or does the city council provide funding to cover the skating equipment for the event? The latter part. So it's being sponsored by a council member, uh, but it's being uh, put on by our recreation division who's gonna have all that equipment on site. Okay, so just to make sure that I understand, so the council member or the city council provides more of like the promotional support for the event? Correct. Okay, so NYC Parks actually provides the equipment itself and the logistics for the skating event? Yes. Okay, awesome, thank you so much. You're welcome, thank you. Thank you. Um, I actually have a quick question about the um, pathways, the pathway along the Henry Hudson Parkway. Any update on that? I know there had been some issues about people saying that there were still there were some potholes in it. That was a project that was supposed to be finished over the winter, but it had to pause because of the cold weather and then it was going to be finished up. And I'm just wondering, is that finished? I haven't actually been on it in a while. So the most recent, uh, recently developed sinkhole, we actually barricaded off late last week, um, and now it's actually fenced off. So DOT actually helped us where they repaved the section of where the area was sinking, so they could kind of do a ride around of the affected area, and we put up fencing for the time being until a solution can be determined and the contractor put back in place to address the condition. Okay, so DOT has fenced around it and they are working, they're gonna be responsible for fixing it or Parks is gonna be responsible no. for fixing it? It's a collaborative effort with DOT, I believe state DOT as well, DEP as well, because uh, there's a, a drain underneath as well that we believe may be an issue. Got it. Okay, so it's great when lots of agencies are involved, but it also occurs to me that that's possibly a recipe for mm, lengthening the response time because that's sort of how bureaucracy works. Does that sound about right? Well, we're staying at week. I don't want to, I don't want to put you on the, on the no, hook. You don't have to answer I, that. But our, our writers are very vocal. Yes. So, you know, I, I believe it's moving along pretty, uh, at, at a, at a good pace. Okay. Excellent. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Okay. And I also, if I didn't, I didn't mention uh, the movies under the stars. We have a uh, Highbridge Park at Raul Wallenberg, because I know uh, Mr. Domingo will kill me if I don't mention Wallenberg as well for something positive here. Raul Wallenberg is having a free movies night on the seventeenth as well, and that as well is also sponsored by a council member, Ms. Carmen De La Rosa. I'm sorry, you said that's on the seventeenth. On June seventeenth as well, the movie's going to be Encanto. Okay, so. You know, lots of opportunities to see Encanto. It is a terrific <laughs> movie. If you haven't seen it, you should go either on the 17th to Wallenberg or on the 3rd to the Morris Jamel Mansion. And frankly, if you have seen it, go see it again. It's a great movie. Super fun. Super fun. I saw, uh, Tracy, I saw you had a small child in the background. If said small child has not seen, uh-huh. If said small child has not seen Encanto, take him to see it. It's terrific. Um, okay, so it is now 717 and we are up to the Central Park Conservancy. Uh, we've got, uh, are, 
your first name is Gray? Yeah. Okay, Gray e Elam or Elam? Gray Elam. Gray Elam. Welcome, welcome. Very happy to hear what you've got to tell us. I hear you've been doing lots of work with the Morris Mill <laughs> Mansion and some other places. Uh, Highbridge Park? Yeah, Highbridge, yep. So for all of the people who say, well, how come Central Park Conservancy has blah, 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 and Uptown doesn't blah, 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 guess what? Everybody, Central Park Conservancy is helping out their Uptown, uh, their uptown neighbors, so tell us about it. Awesome. Um, would you mind if I share my screen real quick? Not at all. Okay. And if you've got a slide deck uh, that you are sharing, if you would not mind sending it to me at yes. uh, lizritter.cb12m at gmail.com, I can throw that in the, in the chat, uh, that will help my note taking. Absolutely happy to send that to you also, along with some of the highlights from the notes. Um, if you could drop that in the chat, that'd be super helpful. I'll pick it up after this. Um, all right. Hi, everyone. It's uh, it's really nice to be here. Thanks so much for having me. Um, I know you have a busy schedule tonight, so I'll try to keep it um, brief. Um, but I am Gray Elam. I'm the director of New York City Programs at Central Park Conservancy. Um, and this is a joint presentation between myself and Danny. Um, and Christopher Heitman, who's um, attending, he's here today as well. Um, and I think that's pretty perfect because this program really is a joint program. It is a partnership. Um, so we're here tonight to talk a little bit about some exciting work that we've been undertaking with the Parks Department uh, at Highbridge. Uh, we've been there since the top of the calendar year. Um, and I'm gonna start just by briefly talking about the program so you have some context. And then uh, I'll provide, or Danny's actually going to provide an overview of the work at Highbridge. Um, and we're happy to take any questions that you have. Uh, so CPC has actually, um, it has, it's been working at parks across the city. Uh, it has a really long legacy of, of working to support New York City uh, park sites since really the beginning of the conservancy. Um, and We've done that through a lot of different programs. We've hosted lots of different programs over the years, which really focused on supporting other park organizations. Um, but I'd say that the backbone of that effort and that portfolio is really the five borough program. And so that's what we're here to talk to you about tonight. So since 2004, the conservancies worked side by side with the parks department to provide technical assistance direct landscape maintenance, restoration support, and training to NYC park staff. Um, and also in some cases to support of uh, community partners as well. Uh, most importantly though, we're doing it at Highbridge this year. Um, so just a little bit more about the program. The program's mission is really to leverage the Conservancy's resources in order to provide conditions um, to leverage our resources to improve parks and improve conditions at parks across New York City. Um, and important to that is really this idea of, you know, it being sustained after we're gone. We show up at a site for a year, um, but we work really closely with the Parks Department and a large motivation behind the, the training piece of it is to make sure that when we do leave, that folks are able to kind of sustain and maintain things long after we move on. Um, so we will know that we've been successful if after a year after we've left, the site is still looking great and no doubt it will. Um, we, the program is actually, um, well, first of all, it's comprised of full-time Central Park Conservancy staff. We have a team of eight right now um, who are working across the five sites you see here. Um, we uh, have four permanent sites in the historic Harlem Parks. Um, and we have one site that rotates annually. So you can see that the, the four sites in red are the, the permanent sites, and the one in black is Highbridge. Last year, that rotating site was St. Mary's. So I'm gonna pass it over to Danny. He's gonna talk a little bit about the scope of work that we've been doing this past year and what we have coming up. Uh, thank you, Gray. So really, um, it's an enrichment program, what it is. Central Park Conservancy has, has agreed to come out to Highbridge Park to be able to lend 
um, some resources to be able to lend some uh, some techniques. They have highly trained personnel who are very good um, at, at different aspects of park maintenance. So they've agreed to come up for a year, as Ms. Gray said, that uh, um, to help train our staff. Um, so pretty much they come with their personnel, they come with their resources, uh, tools and equipment and vehicles and tractors and help teach our staff how to better maintain our sites. Right now at Highbridge Park, um, they're doing a host of programming, but they're also uh, two major undertakers that they've done. They're doing uh, restoration work at two of our ball fields there. Um, and by restoration work, they're aerating, they're also seeding and fertilizing. Um, they're also sharing some techniques on how to cut grass effectively, how to take care of our lawns, how to take care of our ball fields, as well as they're also adding uh, newly planted garden areas, hort areas. Um, they're teaching us on how to maintain those. They're also helping us at Highbridge Park. We have a problem with uh, quality of life issues there. So they're helping us where we're eliminating sight lines um, so that everything is more out in the open and everything is more visible to passerbys. Um, uh, they're helping us at Roger Morris Park as well, where they're doing a lot of lawn restoration work there um, and aerating, seeding and fertilizing and also helping uh, maintain our garden areas at Roger Morris Park. Um, it's a great tool. It's been something that our staff has gotten a lot out of. Um, I believe it, it's fruitful because once Central Park Conservancy staff moves on to the next project that they're going to undertake, I believe it leaves us in a better in a better position to better maintain our sites and our staff better for the experience where they become more knowledgeable, more skilled, and more trained themselves, where they can then pass it along to, you know, uh, employees that come after them as well. So thank you to Central Park Conservancy. I need to say that honestly, we, this is this is definitely a partnership. We've been doing it hand in hand. Um, I do want to also touch on one other thing here, which is just the work that's being done at the playgrounds. It hasn't started yet, but there is um, uh, on the work plan is really some horticultural management, including replacement of dead plant materials with new plants, um, weeding, mulching, watering, fence installation, you name it. Um, and then lawn restoration between Adventure Playground and Sunken Playgrounds. Um, so that's kind of what's what's on the docket and, and soon to come. So with that, we're happy to take any questions you have. Um, yeah, thank you. That's fantastic. I love this. I just love this so much. Um, so we've got Dan Sommer saying thank you. Uh, Daryl uh, Cochrane has uh, a quest. Oh no, Daryl was at, was answering somebody's question about what agenda item we're on. Um, are there questions from the public or from the uh, committee? Um, I don't think I'm putting words in anybody's mouth if I say on behalf of everybody that we are grateful for this. Um, I love that you're not only doing material improvements, but the horticultural equivalent of, you know, what is it? You give a man a fish, you feed him for a day, you teach a man to fish, you feed him for a lifetime. So thank you for, um, it's a little bit of a mixed metaphor, but thanks for teaching us to fish. Um, I think it, uh, it puts our, it, it, it makes our already wonderful parks even more wonderful. And as nice as Central Park is, we all know we do have the best parks uptown. So I, I give it to you. I, I mean, Highbridge is an amazing park. And right? that the water tower is a phenomenal. Yeah. <laughs> pretty, pretty great. Pretty yeah. great. Also really hard to get to the Bronx, my second favorite borough from Central Park. Can't do it, but you can do it. <laughs> so um, we've got a question from Daryl. Yeah. Hi. Thanks so much for the presentation. And yes, we do appreciate it very, very much. Um, I was just wondering, and I'm sorry if I missed this at the beginning, the, the payment structure for all this, like how is this paid for? Yeah, it's in kind from Central Park Conservancy. Oh, it's baked into our budget. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, that's fantastic. Um, I, I actually have a question about that. Um, you know, the Central Park Conservancy, and I was just, there was a 
really interesting um, program on some kind of public radio, a uh, public television station about five of the great New York City parks, one in each borough and the one in Manhattan. They talked about the founding of Central Park and um, Ms. Barrows and everything that she did with the founding of the Central Park Conservancy. And I'm just wondering if people in this community have questions about how did you do that? How do we do that here? Who would be a person at the Central Park Conservancy? I mean, I know that's a short question that's actually a very a huge sure. question. Um, but yeah. Uh, I mean, first of all, that is a really good question. So you're you're asking specifically about the formation of friends groups, yeah? yeah. Um, and it's a really good question, and it's one that comes up all the time. Um, I'd be happy to talk to anyone. We've I have a long um, we've worked to kind of help support people through that process. There's a partnership for parks is mm -hmm. a tremendous resource. Um, they tend to be kind of an incubator for friends of groups. Um, but certainly I'd be happy to talk to anyone and um, kind of answer any kind of initial questions and point people in the right direction. Cool, thank you. I mean, I know Thanks. Partnerships is, is an amazing group, but you know, sometimes it's just kind of helpful to get um, a, a different view of that. So yeah. um, thank you very much. I appreciate sure. it. I'm just looking to see if we've got any other questions. Alexis Marnell, gonna let you close this out. Okay, uh, thank you so much for the work you're gonna be doing or you have done at Roger Morris Park. And also again, thank you, Danny. And I I know I'm not phrasing this right, but um, so you did this great job restoring the lawn. What, um, are there any other projects you'll be undertaking at Roger Morris Park? Yeah, absolutely. So there's, I mean, and definitely Danny, uh, feel free to pop in here. Um, there's, I mean, there's basic, you know, maintenance and operations that's kind of ongoing, but in terms of restoration, um, it's a lot of uh, athletic field restoration work, uh, you know, uh, removing grass from the infield, uh, aerating. I'm talking about Roger Morris by the man. Oh, I'm Morris. sorry, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, so at Ro Roger Morris, it's mostly lawn restoration, um, mulching beds, tree pits, um, things of that nature at this point. And, and, he, he and worked the with the the conservancy is working with our horticulture division, our gardeners, to, they're not gardeners by trade, but they're willing to help out giving our resources for New York City parks that we have in the district there, that they're willing to help us out there and help maintain those garden beds a little better than they have been in the, the past year or so. Yeah, I mean, I know people in my neighborhood would love to volunteer on the next volunteer day. Yeah. Great. I will say I, the way we, um, we, the way that we uh, develop work plans is we work really closely at the Parks Department at the top of the year to think through, A, which park we should work in. Um, uh, often it's parks that have like, recently been invested in or is really anchor parks for the city. Um, and uh, we'll work really hand in hand to figure out what the priorities for the park are with, with staff on site. Thank you. Do, uh, do you have a specific like stewardship day at the Jamel in the garden. And I don't want to make an, a, a suggestion that's out of line, but if you don't, is it possible to add that? I'm guessing Alexis is probably not the only interested individual. Yeah. We, we, we do not have a recurring volunteer day at Roger Morris, but I believe there is uh, talks going on with somebody at Partnership for Parks in regards to making a friends group to help with the gardening aspect of Roger Morris. Okay. All right, we got that electric. Oh, no, so whatever friend, whatever friends group does pop up, I'll make sure that I make everybody aware of uh, what the friends group uh, is, so that hopefully we can all you know join. You know, more members are better. Cool. Thank you, Tracy. You had a question. I was just going to say Morris Jamel regularly has volunteer days for families to come in. At least they, they had okay. last summer, spring, and this past fall. I don't think that they've had one this spring yet. But um, And if you get on the Morris Jamel um, mailing list, they'll let you know when it happens. Cool. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Um, 
Maria Luna asked a question in the chat about the selection of artworks displayed in parks and who makes the decision as to what is installed. So I will actually, I, I'm gonna let Danny answer that. That's not specific to this item. She actually had thrown a little bit of a question earlier in the chat and I, earlier in the meeting and I missed it. So I think that's a question for Danny that I should have directed to him during his report. Yep, oh, you're muted. So I, I don't wanna misspeak, but I know it goes through a rigorous process and review where I believe eventually marketing uh, Arts and Antiquities Division ends up being involved in approving what artwork goes where. Got it. Yeah, that that com that comports with what I have heard uh, heard Jennifer tell us before, uh, and that Parks doesn't generally do. It's art Arts and Antiquities if it's a permanent installation, and those are fairly unusual, and that Parks has. Uh, a separate program for temporary installations. And I believe temporary is anything up to, but not over a year. Although during COVID, there were some things that went up that were supposed to have been temporary, but COVID, so they were up for a little longer than a year. Um, Maria, yep, uh, she's saying thanks in the chat. So I guess that answers her question. Um, Okay. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, Gray, this was uh, super helpful. If you could please extend to all of the folks at, uh, at the Central Park Conservancy our collective gratitude. And you are welcome to stay for the rest of the meeting, but you absolutely we will not be offended if you decide you've got other things to do and places to go. I may go make dinner, we'll, we'll see. But I um, I do wanna thank you guys for uh, giving me the time and space to be here. I also really wanna give a big shout out and thank you to Danny and to Christopher. Um, they're just wonderful, as you guys already know, wonderful partners. Um, so thanks everyone, really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank so you, Grace, for your time. Bye. Appreciate you. Um, okay, next up we have Christopher Amy. Uh, so just by way of intro, remind me your title. De Deputy Director of Marine Infrastructure. I cleverly took last year, last month's minutes as a template and I am taking minutes in real time. So hopefully I will get the minutes of this meeting out sooner than I usually do. Um, Oh, somebody just threw into the chat um, a link to uh, the Parks Department's Arts and Antiquities Temporary Guidelines. So Maria, feel free to click on that and get more information than you possibly wanted. Um, and Babette Audant, who just joined, don't worry, you're not late. We're gonna hear from Christopher Amy about um, the Dykeman Piers and Waterfront, and then we will be hearing about Lily Brown Playground. So you are right on time. So last summer, I forget the date, might've been the middle of July, I think, we had a really interesting, uh, very well attended public information meeting presentation from Christopher and his team about some of the serious structural issues along the Dykeman waterfront. Lots of input on things that people really want to see, that people really want to see fixed hopes, aspirations, and articulation of uh, budget and timeline. And now I think we're getting an update uh, from Christopher. It will not be this is not a final proposed um, plan. So this is not, I believe this is, correct me if I'm wrong, this is not a final plan. So this there, is- Yeah, there, there'll, be some more, there'll be some more updates, especially for PDC and depending on what, uh, you know, Public Design Commission and for Department of Environmental Conservation when we go for our environmental permitting for building in the water, which is a complicated process. So there could be some tweaks, but more or less what I wanna show now is uh, tonight is, is uh, as close to final as we're going to get in terms of the amenities that we're looking to restore and provide 
and based on the comments that I've received back from the public, which has been a pretty robust conversation. So thank you, Liz, and, and, and to your commission, uh, your board for that help. So are you going to need a rezo on this? No, this is, so when I came, uh, so yes, we did have that session last June, just about a year ago, that public session at the marina. Uh, I also came to the community board back in November and presented the initial. So this is an attempt to update some, some, some kind of, um some tweaks that have been made since that point um and I, I said at that time i would be back with some some more updates and, and i think what i have to show is a bit more uh refined tonight and it shouldn't take too long but i wanted to just just to do that i do not need any additional resos we're good to move forward with our permitting and all those process things we love so much um and i can do my share screen now if that's all right yes you have that capability because you are a panelist okay can you see my my presentation here Yes, and okay. once again, if you can uh, do me the favor of sending me the slide deck, makes my note taking a lot easier. Absolutely, we'll do. We'll do. Thank you. Um, so again, yes, hi everyone. Um, Christopher Amy, Deputy Director of Marine Infrastructure. My colleague Melissa Goldberg is on the line with me as well. Um, but this is just uh, an update to the presentation that was made last November. So I will try to breeze through this stuff so it's not duplicative. After the presentation, I'll drop a link in the chat, which is a link to the prior presentation last November, which really gets into the weeds on the history and, and a lot of the initial early on input about what this site is, uh, what the, what's the desire here from the community that we've developed. Um, but basically this came out of the inward points of agreement, the rezoning, which is really to restore the existing structures at the site uh, and to open up the street end and to provide eco dock access. Um, and just to look at the site and where it is. Uh, yes, it is in a flood zone, and I'm just going to jump forward a bit. Some of the historical photos. I do love to point out how historical the nature of the boating at this uh, this area is, and I love to be in you know in the business of restoring that access and maintaining that access. Um, a few tweaks to the overall existing plan. There were some survey errors early on, so just to update those, they did make some changes to our design. I'll highlight those as we go through. <clears throat> But this is generally the area, and I'll pause just to uh, just to, to highlight what we're talking about. This is the Inwood Canoe Club Pier, uh, which needs to be repaired. The floating dock system in the marina itself needs to be repaired. The fishing pier itself is unfortunately a teardown. It cannot be repaired, so it is going to be replaced. And what was presented last time showed the fishing pier uh, being relocated into the marina, and we'll look at that in just a moment. But generally speaking, the fishing pier would be moved into this location to have better range of control uh, with park staff maintaining the marina 24-7, 365. Um, it will allow for fishing, passive uh, uh, recreation and views of uptown of the GW, or yeah, uptown of the GWB, no, downtown, and then up upriver of the, uh, the, the Cuomo Bridge as well. So the, we're consolidating the piers into the marina while restoring the Inwood Canoe Club here. And then budget depending, and we're still we're still looking at this very closely. If we can, we're going to essentially be providing a new plaza or park type uh, access point at the street end um, with some shoreline restoration work uh, involved as well. And we'll, again, we'll recap all that in just a moment. So I'm just gonna breeze through the photos, the existing site photos. Um, I'll pause on this slide here just to point out um, one of the major comments that uh, was missing through all of this, and I'll, I'll recap some of the comments that we've received from the public, but what was missing was some of the context from the fishing community, who I know uses this fishing pier a lot. Um, and back in March, I was able to take time with DEC, Department of Environmental Conservation, who runs fishing derbies at the pier here, and to sit down and talk to them about best practices and what we can do to improve the design of the fishing pier for fishing purposes. So, um, uh, that was just a very productive meeting and and their comments will be reflected in just a moment okay bear with me a second so the uh community desires here um uh just what we've been uh, found so far uh is, is highlighted here but one of the main things i'll point out here is uh the desire to uh, adjust the fencing at the end of the street end, um, which felt uh, the terms that were used to, to describe it were a prison like. Um, and, and I think we have found a design that kind of accommodates both the maintenance and, and, and security needs of the site while reducing the fencing and, and kind of the imposing nature of the street end fence. 
Um, this is the peer that was presented last time around, just to kind of refresh your memory. And uh, uh, this is the uh, re redesigned peer concept, which essentially provides the same uh, the same amenities, same access, but the changes that have been made are, you'll notice this bend here in the peer. It's no longer straight, right? So go, there, there's the straight peer, there's the bend, allows for additional slips to be snuck into the, the deepest waters in the site while also allowing this boat ramp here where boats are put into the river to be able to uh, uh, go around the pier and make it out into the river. Um, and then some changes to the shape of the pier head. And without getting too into detail about, about how um, the, the logic behind it, it's for the benefit of the anglers, for the fishermen um, to, to change that shape, to provide for, for areas that are sort of out of the way of the flow of traffic, of pedestrian traffic on the pier. Um, and, and the DEC uh, uh, angling team described some of the type of uses, um, setting back the benches uh, uh, is, one, is one benefit that we provide here. Uh, and of course, the addition of lighting, which we always intended to provide, but wasn't shown last time. In terms of the boating, we've also changed some of the pile locations to provide a smooth run here on those, uh, that run of floating docks. Um, another quick update is the fencing diagram, which was not available last time when we made this presentation. Uh, there will be a more robust eight foot fence at the pier head than what was shown prior. That's a re requirement of uh, marine security uh, regulations through the Coast Guard. Any marina that can accommodate vessels uh, of a, up to 150, you know, 150 or greater passenger count needs this heightened security. Um, and so we'll be providing for that with the assumption that the eco dock may be um, uh, the eco dock may be uh, accessible by larger vessels. Um, these green runs at the pier head you see here are ADA C rails. Um, they're intended for ADA purposes, people with uh, so, so they don't obstruct the views of, of folks who are sitting at benches uh, or, or uh, maybe uh, using wheelchairs, but they're also beneficial to fishermen. There are existing ADA C rails on the existing fishing pier, which DEC pointed out to us are great for their younger fishing, uh, fishing crowd when they're doing the fishing derbies and fishing clinics. And so we've uh, accommodated those with a couple areas on the pier uh, in ideal angling spots and also in spots that are angled towards the upriver view shed, which is just fantastic. So you can sit at those benches and appreciate the view. Um, the seating was a, a big comment last time around. People wanted that seating maintained so they could have those view sheds, um, but also space for people to bring their own, maybe bring their own uh, seating, uh, their own chairs out to the pier. And we think we've kind of met a nice, uh, a nice balance there. And then you'll see the gates at the end of the pier as well uh, to provide for access to larger vessels like the, the sailing ship, the clear water uh, sailing vessel that comes to 79th Street Boat Basin. We're hoping to bring similar uh, activation, um, similar kind of amenity vessels up here for uh, the community to come out and do historic, you know, historic vessel tours or uh, sightseeing uh, up and down the river from this location. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, this was the canoe club pier slide shown last time. Um, and there's just a few updates that I want to highlight here. So I'll just jump back and forth so you can kind of visualize the change. Uh, one of the, cert the, the things that we found actually when we went on site with ICC and reviewed the original presentation was that it didn't mesh with the reality we found on the ground. There were some survey errors. So, so and, and that happens, right? But what we, the good news is when we identified that survey area, we realized there was a lot more bulkhead run we could capture, more patio space at ICC that could be built out. So that's what's reflected here. Um, another thing that was noticed was that uh, there was no ADA access to this patio. So this is a bulkhead, uh, a bulkhead. I don't know if you can see my cursor actually. So let me know if you can or can't. We can. Um, oh, you could, good, uh, that's helpful. So there's a step here to access the patio and there's not really clear path from here gonna, to here. I'm gonna interrupt you for just a second um, yeah. to respond to, to a comment that someone's a little bit confused. Um, so it's the Dykeman Marina and Inwood Hill Park is the park that starts north of Dykeman Street, but Fort Washington Park is the park that goes along the Hudson River up to Dykeman Street. So when you're south of Dykeman Street, along that little walkway that hugs the river, we think of it as Dykeman, but it's technically Fort Washington Park. So for people who are wondering why is this called the Fort Washington Park Dykeman Marina Project, it's because that parkland up to Dykeman Street is Fort Washington Park and the parkland 
uh, north of Dykeman Street, that's Inwood Hill Park. Does that help? Yes, it helps, thank you. And I guess at, an, in an, at a later time, in another moment, I would like to know if there's any advocacy that can be done so that that part that park land itself can be distinguished from Inwood Hill Park and from Fort Washington Park. So it can be like a standalone, have its own name. Um, even though I know it's connected to the other parks, just that'll, that'll be another conversation. Yeah, cool. Anyway, I, I didn't want to interrupt too much, but I think people always get more out of a presentation if they totally get all the context. Sure. So throwing that sure. question out, Naima, because I'm guessing you are not the only person who had that question. You're just the only person who asked it. Sure, and yeah, please do interject because I am I am kind of skipping past some of the 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 first go around presentations kind of context, right? So uh, yes, that's that is the the location. And thank you, Liz, for um, perfectly describing it. Uh, let me get back to where I was in the canoe clip here. Okay, so the new design uh, expands upon the patio, which it's really the existing patio, and we're restoring something that's been out of commission for quite a while because of essentially collapsing bulkhead. Um, we are providing for a new ADA access point to that patio from the greenway because the existing step, which will have to be maintained as a step, is not accessible and there's not really clear pathing from the main entry point to this patio. So, you know, folks with mobility issues will be able to, to enjoy that, uh, that area as well. Um, there's a redesign. I'm flipping back and forth again here. There's a redesign of this planting bed. And the intent there is to allow access from the pier deck into this kind of staging storage area for ICC, which is where they keep their um, uh, their racks of vessels and the other kinds of things that they have there in the upland area. Uh, they also requested an access point to the water. So this black line here is the is the chain link fence. It's all existing chain link fence. We'll be resetting that chain link fence into the bulkhead and providing an access point where they can slide vessels in and out of the water for operational concerns. There's also going to need to be a revetment installed along the edge of this bulkhead. Um, so these are all just some generally updates to this this site plan here. A what installed? A uh, revetment. Thank you for asking. So a stone rubble wall uh, uh, edge, right? Like a, like a sloping uh, shoreline with stone to keep it from eroding too significantly. I, right now, it's kind of an unprotected shoreline. And we just want to make sure that with this new bulkhead being installed, we don't change the conditions to adversely impact the upland area to somehow trigger an erosion point. So the revetment will just be a way to kind of trail off this bulkhead here so that it doesn't uh, become a point where water kind of scours around it and takes, you know, takes fill into the, the river. It's a, it's a engineering engineering type requirement, but it'll be beneficial to, to stopping any potential erosion of this upland area. Um, all of the in-water work, however, for the pier remains the same, which is basically just a, a repair of what's there. Um, and this is the fencing diagram of what it will look like. Again, this is all an exi existing fencing here. Um, uh, for the most part, I think the only change to it is this little run here, which will keep people from potentially being able to access the canoe pier from the water side at low tide, because you could potentially scramble along the shoreline down here. And then, of course, providing new gate access to access the patio. Now, moving back over to the street end, this is over near the 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 Dykeman Fields, we call it, up in Inwood Hill Park. Um, this is what was shown at the last go around, and there have been some quick tweaks to this that I will point out. Um, in the parking area, which just as a reminder, uh, is, is something that we're uh, required to provide to the restaurant operator as part of our agreement with them. Um, this, uh, there was not properly noted on the prior iteration, some gateway access that was required for the sort of back of house for the restaurant. So their, their their dumpster access and some of their storage access is here. So these gates need to be maintained as an accessible entry point. So we've had to remove some planting areas and make up for that with tree count and other areas, which we've successfully done. Um, and notably, um, we've added some additional gates to the front of the plaza type area to make it more open when they're open during the uh, during during the regular day. Uh, the gate uh, I'll get to in just, the fence, I should say, I'll get to in just an, a, a moment on the next slide. Um, the greenway connection point, uh, we've moved to a sort of an elevated table, a uh, speed table style installation, and I'll explain that in just a moment, but uh, uh, in the rendering, you'll be able to see it, um, but that'll help with traffic control in the area. 
and um, they moved to a louvered style fencing around the restaurant. So if you've seen it, the restaurant has a, a picket fence with like a fabric kind of blocking the view of the storage area, which is in, in, in various stages of, 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 of repair or disrepair at any given time. We're going to move to kind of a louvered fence to mask that back of house area um, to, to really focus people on the shoreline, which is where the beautiful uh, viewpoints are going to be. So the fence agreement we came up with um, internally to kind of reduce that, you know, again, quote unquote, you know, prison type feeling when you're at site is a five foot steel picket. And I'll show in a moment what that five foot steel picket looks like. Uh, uh, we have an example photo of one from Riverside Park that will be mirroring and it will be, you know, it, it'll allow for pretty clear views towards the shoreline while also uh, um, being able to secure the site as best as best as we can. Um, the next section here is some renderings. So. Um, this is the existing shoreline with the, fish, the existing fishing pier that needs to be demolished and this old uh, um, uh, industri industrial remnant uh, um, structure, concrete wall structure. And this is what we are, are showing for the rendering here. Um, you see the CSO still needs to be you know, protected by some, some level of fill, but otherwise we're really expanding upon the scale of the sand offering in this area. And we did go to DE p and get approval for this concept recently also amtrak has provided their approval uh for this project as well and i'll speak to a bit more to the timelines of the process coming forward uh going forward this is the street end and this is our view of what we're looking to do for the street end so i wanted to talk again about that that uh speed table style installation the greenway elevation will be maintained it will be the cars that have to bump up and over this uh this 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 access point here which will help to signal to cars you know this is primarily a pedestrian and cyclist route this greenway connection point here and uh really this parking lot uh, is intended to be um provided for the benefit of the restaurant um and and should be you know maintained and safe uh people should be maintaining safe you know safe speeds and safe operation in that area and that speed table will help with that this highlights a bit of the view of what it would look like with that steel picket um, and then this is that louvered fence I mentioned, that screening fence. So really refocusing your eyes away from the restaurant and over towards the river. Uh, I am not personally a fan of, of, of uh, misleading rendering. So I do want to point out that in reality, I think that the view from about where this uh, this is right here, where my, my cursor is right here, I think that view is actually obstructed by the existing uh, DEP CSO, but we weren't able to correct that in time for the presentation tonight. So apologize for that. And this is just a, a look at what the pier, the fish, the, the fishing and, and marina pier will look like inside of the cat, excuse me. Okay. <laughs> um, we don't mind animals. We yeah, like, yeah. Like children and pets in our I do some I, I do sometimes when I'm presenting this. <laughs> it's like it's okay. <laughs> um uh, he's he's a lovely, he's a lovely animal. Uh the fishing pier itself, uh, this is what it will look like. So the scale of it isn't too far off from the dock run that existed there today. Um, there you can see the the screen, the the wave screen um, underneath the pier, which will be blocking the waves, and some of the kind of um, just some of the amenities that are being provided. The lamp posts will be there, and and the eco dock is shown here as well. So it's 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 a bit of a distance away from the waterfront, but it is there in the room. Um, this is a material palette. I just want to point out the lighting to be used. Uh, PDC recently approved the use of this a dock style boat basin, uh, a lamp on the pier, and then we'll use the precedent lighting within the park, um, which is uh, what's used there now. The composite wave screen, just these slats under the pier that help to block the wave action. This is that five foot height steel picket fence that I mentioned that's uh, used in Riverside Park, and that will be the um, uh, what's being provided in the uh, plaza type area. Um, and then these are just uh, uh, items referenced through, again throughout the presentation. I'll point out the the C railing precedent for the pier is the ADOC C rail as well. So it's something something akin to this, and PDC will be reviewing this in the near term future. And when I talked about that heavier duty um, marine security uh, fencing for the head of the pier, that's something like this. This is kind of clunky. All the signage, that's not what we want. That's not what we're going to be providing. But just to give you a sense of the scale of the type of security required at this type of an installation, that's what we're looking at. And then we have uh, our planting palette. There's a lot of trees. Uh, ultimately, we do have some removals of trees highlighted in the initial presentation still, uh, but, but we're providing more trees than we're having to remove. And this is the final look at the overall site. Um, 
uh, just for a moment talk about process. Uh, we came uh, to the community back uh, almost exactly a year ago now, and we're right on track for an 18 month delivery of this design. We expect to deliver it uh, January of 24 and then go into procurement and then uh, construction would ideally start sometime around January of 25. Um, we have to go to DEC for environmental permitting. We're about to submit those documents. SBS, of course, uh, uh, Small Business Services does construction permitting on the water and we'll be presenting to them as well soon. But we think we're, we're, we're right on track for that. Um, and I do, I also wanted to mention, um, I had one other thought. Uh, oh, yes, of course. If if anyone has any comments on this, um, I'm I want to, happy to take questions and comments now as well. But please do email me. I've received, you know, dozens of comments on this project, just suge design suggestions. Um, and I've been working closely with HRCS, Hudson River Community Sailing, Inwood Canoe Club, our partners here at the site, um, the Hudson Restaurant as well, of course. Um, and, and, and we've been trying our best to deliver for 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 you know, those uh, groups that we work with, but also for the community at large. And I've just been really blown away by the amount of um, input and I'm open to more. So please, you uh, you can find my email address. I'll put that in the chat as well. Send me an email directly um, and, and we'll continue to work to incorporate um, whatever we can. But thank you all very much. Fantastic. Thank you very much. I appreciate this. You covered a lot of ground very quickly, and I'm grateful for that because we do still have two more presentations. So I'm happy to take a couple of questions. Um, but I, before I do, I would like to ask the extent to which I just want to be clear about your timeline. So there's there's a huge like permitting process and approvals process. Um, and then you would go into design. So if I have this straight, you'd be going into design in 2024 and beginning construction or in 2020. Well, you're already in design, but you yeah. to construction like January of 2025, ideally. Um, I imagine this is a pretty lengthy construction timeline. Yeah, uh, I'm, happy, I'm happy to talk about that, Liz. Um, if you could also talk specifically about the potential impacts on the programming seasons for, I don't imagine this is going to have an impact on the dining season for the Hudson, but it may well have an impact on the programming season for the Inwood Canoe Club and or for Hudson River Community Sailing. So if you could just speak to that, you know, specifically. Sure. Um, so. I'll speak at first to the schedule to uh, I'll reiterate. Yeah, I'm going to be delivering a completed design. Uh, Parks is going to be delivering a completed design on this project January of 24. It takes us a year to find a to find and, and procure and contract with a construction firm to do this work. Um, and so that's the, and so then a year out from that is when we can actually break ground. That's the January of 25. Now, what we're real the contingent point, the, 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 the crux of all of this is we need to find out when we can start actually start work. And the, the, the big barrier here is in water moratoriums. That's why we need to go to DEC. So we expect in this, in the fall, DEC will come back to us with a defined in water construction moratorium. That's what comes from, from NOAA, from the federal government, defining to us when we can actually drive piles in the river and when we can't. And that has to do with fish spawning seasons and, and, and things of that nature. It's, it's environmental protective uh, uh, issue. So if they tell us we can only do in, uh, in water construction in, let's say, you know, uh, uh, April, well, then we have to wait until April to start this project because it, so much of it is in water work. Um, the good news is that the, uh, uh, the timeline for these structures uh, has been relatively defined at this point. We anticipate that once we can break ground in the water, you know, uh, uh, through this moratorium, um, the canoe club repair shouldn't take uh, too much longer than about four months, maybe six months. That's that's kind of uh, the range that our engineers have given us. The, the marina pier itself, probably a year. And so the hope is that we can have this project completed within one year to limit uh, 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 to a season's worth of disruption on any on any given service. Now that said, um, uh, the Hudson, I, I'll point out, we're not doing any construction to the Hudson within this project. We're maintaining access to the restaurant through this project. Uh, we've also been working very closely with 
Inwood Canoe Club and Hudson River Community Sailing to talk about how we can maintain access to their clubs through this process. But there's an ongoing conversation right now about exactly what that looks like and how that works. And that's something that we're, is happening between parks and those groups uh, at present. And I'm not, I'm not prepared to speak specifically to that uh, tonight. But that's something I think that when we have those fish moratoriums, and it's, it sounds so silly to be such a dry, it's, it's not silly, but it sounds funny to be a driver of a project of this scale and magnitude. But we really need to hear back from DEC about when we can get out there hammering piles into the river bottom to really say exactly when a disruption will or will not occur of the scale that could impact uh, uh, the programming that's being offered at this site. And of course, we're all interested in, in limiting those impacts to the greatest extent possible um parks as well as as, as our partner um our partner groups at the site so uh we expect to be to be able to provide like a deeper dive on that information um like i said when when dec reports to us in the fall then we can really develop a, a preliminary construction schedule to define those potential outages and and that's when i think we would be more comfortable right. so uh, the take to us. right so the takeaway here is yes there will almost certainly be some kind of disruption but we do not know what exactly that disruption will be and that that is going to be largely driven by DEP, NOAA and the fish um, and that parks is and will is working with and is going to continue working with HRCH and the ICC. Uh, before I go to uh, Daryl's question, uh, we've got a question in the Q&A about would there be parking for the community in that entire area? And the answer actually is no. The purpose of that street end area is to provide a, mod a moderate amount of contractually required parking for the restaurant. And it looks to me like the beauty of this design is it will, instead of providing parking, that isn't really available to anybody, we're gonna be taking some of that space back for pedestrian activity and just general uh, beauty and planting. Um, so Daryl, what is your question or comment? Yeah, I actually had two questions. Um, one, is there a uh, drinking fountain bottle filler in the southern part of the of, in the uh what is it fort washington side of this uh, thanks yeah thanks for the question uh there's not um uh, there is not a water service a formal water service provided that to that extent south at present so if that's some yeah that would be something that is not scoped within this project and it would be relatively expensive to provide a, a to code drinking fountain access anywhere much further south than the what's labeled NYC Parks building here where the uh, or Hudson River Community Sailing where the, 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 I think that's the termination of like the actual water service at the site. So it's a utilities question as much as it is a, a lack of it having been installed prior. Sure, sure. And I think there's still though you're maintaining the one that's in in Wood Hill Park near the uh, ball field fence there. I'm not as familiar, but I'll take I'll take your word for it. Oh uh, yeah, it's like just out of the picture. the The other question was, you know, we also are uh, we have arts in our committee's name, and on the Inwood Hill side for in the in the entryway to the park, um, is there any thought to some sort of public art installation as well? It's not provided for through this project, um, but uh so so i i should say no right but that there are op i would imagine there could be opportunities found through a separate uh separate effort um and that's a conversation you know if, if we wanted to have a breakout conversation about opportunities i might have thoughts on it but it's just not something provided through this project great thank you All right, thank you um i do also want to say that um i love the fact that i love the pun that by angling the uh, peer, you have better angling opportunities. That's just not something I get to say very often. So thank you for that. Liz, I was going to say, I, you almost perfectly segued to me with that teach Amanda Fish comment. <laughs> so there was just a few too many comments in between that kind of broke the, broke the rhythm, but that was great. Well, thank you for that. 
Okay, I would, uh, we could totally talk a lot about this, but since we still have two very full agenda items, uh, one of which requires a rezo, I would like to move to that since I am not seeing additional hands. Um, but thank you very much for this. I know you probably have other things going on, but it occurs to me you might actually want to hang out to hear the EDC presentation if you haven't already heard it, because it is different, but related. Um, so just a, just a thought. Um, and with that, um, I would like to queue up uh, whoever is presenting for Lily Brown Playground. That looks like Tara, you're with NYC EDC. Uh, who's doing Lily Brown Playground? Is that Leslie? No, that's, um, that's Ms. Cho. Oh, yes, you are. Uh, Cecilia Cho, are you a presenter or are you an attendee? Oh my goodness, let me promote you to a to panelist. And John Ernsberger, are you a member of the community or are you on the design team for Lily? I am also on the team. Thank you. Okay, let me Thanks for promote, having us. let me promote you as well. Okay, great. Okay, excellent. So sorry that I did not have you both um, on there. Have you been successfully promoted, John? Promote to panel. Trying this again. There we go. Okay. Okay. Let me just get my screens out great and before i give you the floor i just want to remind people that the lily brown playground is this wonderful playground um, on uh riverside drive and that wedge between the lower drive and the upper drive in the lower 160s it is a sweet playground desperately in need of some renovation my children are 30 and 32 and that playground needed a little bit of help when I took them there, um, let's just say quite a while ago. So I am delighted that uh, we've got um, some money from council member Sean Abreu who gave us, uh, I see from your slide, $3.75 million, which is fantastic. Um, we did have a public scoping meeting several months ago, um, and I appreciate the effort that you all put into having uh, multiple meetings, including an on-site meeting at Word Up um, that was streamed and that was bilingual, offered translation. So I appreciate the uh, robust community input into this, and with that, um, please do send me the, the slide deck to help my note taking and uh, take it away. Okay, great. Um, my name is Cecilia Cho. I'm a landscape architect and the project manager uh, for Lindley Brown Playground. I'm joined by John Ernstberger, who's the deputy director of landscape architecture, and also Leslie Peoples, who's the director of landscape architecture from Manhattan. So, um, so for Lindley Brown Playground, um, we have, as Liz mentioned, a 3.75 from council member Abreu, and we have about a third of an acre. So for these beginning slides, they're more background. So I'm going to try to cover them a little faster so that we can look at the design and then leave time for, you know, Q&A and any kinds of clarifications. So for our goal, it's mainly to upgrade the play features, increasing accessibility, while also facilitating some passive use and being able to um, host community events, all while improving the access, the circulation, and the sight lines. So here is our site. Um, we're in Manhattan in Washington Heights. And here you can see Riverside Drive, and this is Upper Riverside Drive and West 162nd Street. It's, and the site is basically on a hill and then you can have access from West 162nd Street or from Riverside Drive. Uh, luckily for our site, we don't have any flood risk in the coastal. 
and no risk in moderate flooding for high storms or for extreme flooding for storms. And I mentioned this because parks, if it is, if we are doing a reconstruction in a site that's affected by flooding, we take that into consideration. But for our site, we don't have to. So our surrounding land use, it's mostly residential and then close by are more mixed use. Here's our neighborhood context. Uh, at parks, we try to have parks within a walking distance of where everyone lives. So for here, even though Fort Washington Park does seem closer, the actual access point is more than 10 minutes away. You have to go a little lower down and then cross over. And then for our existing conditions, so I just wanna mention that North is at the top of our page here, but in our plans, our North is gonna be on our right side. So just for orientating, and then this is Riverside Drive and then Upper Riverside and then 162nd Street. So if we look at our site um, existing, we have the main um, existing play equipment, the two to five, the five to 12, we have swings and then the spray shower and then kind of a larger open space. Uh, within the site, there are public restrooms, but they aren't within our contract and currently they are non-ADA compliant but we will be bringing up the grade so that at the entrance level, it will be easier to access. Uh, there is also a flagpole uh, within the site. And then some site analysis. Uh, Liz mentioned this site has needed some help for a while. So luckily we have a chance to do that now. Um, a lot of the play units are a little worn out. There's some ponding within the site of water collecting. And then also, I just want to mention the, the, the slopes on the site. Um, they're currently um, not uh, ADA accessible. So we'll be looking at that also. So I think the main access is from 162nd Street, and then you go down into the site. There are also a set of stairs here also. Um, for tree inventory, we're keeping almost all the trees. There's a few small trees that we have to uh, remove in order to put in an accessible ramp. Uh, this is a shade study just to look at where we're getting sun within this very nicely tree populated site. So if you look at um, the summer solstice, which is the day with the uh, longest amount of sun, and if we look at the hottest time period, which can be from like 12 to about four, there's more sun kind of in the middle area. And this is where the new spray shower will be located. And then I just want to mention for the, the spring and fall equinoxes, this is kind of where some seeding can be so that you can get a little bit more sun when it's dark outside. So these are photos um, of the site. Uh, the photo on the left shows the, how it's situated within that hill. So we have these retaining walls. They're in good condition, so they just need very minor surfacing, which is great because we can use more of the funds for the actual uh, play elements. This is also just showing that wall and how it's situated next to a busy road. Uh, this is a seating area existing when you enter the site. And then the photo on the right shows um, just the main elements as you look into the site. Another view of the play equipment and then a view of the swings here. And then a view of kind of a specific, the wall art, and then the existing spray shower here, and then a view of the back also. So currently there's only one spray shower that works there. I think there used to be more, but they don't function anymore. So uh, we had uh, two in-person, uh, two virtual community input meetings, one in January, and then these are the notes from that meeting. And then we also had a second one virtual that was bilingual and also hosted um, at Word Up. So we had uh, more feedback. I'm sorry, and what was the date of the January meeting? The January meeting was uh, the 19th. And then we had the bilingual one in March 7th. And taking all everyone's comments in addition to 30 online input responses. I've consolidated the main um, uh, elements that affect design. So I wanna mention uh, people love the swings. They wanted more swings and there was a desire for more bigger kid swings. 
Um, there were requests for climbing structures, a big or twisty slide, and some sensory play. Um, there was a big request to keep the open space within the site so that there could be kind of imaginative play, um, spaces for birthday parties and gatherings, but also crucially a space remaining for adults also with game tables. Uh, and the last part was there was a request to make art kind of like a dry erase board. And so let's uh, keep going. And then this is the schematic design um, for the site. So I'm going to go from left to right, or actually we'll go as the way you would enter the park. So if you entered from 162nd Street, you would go down a new set of accessible ramps. So they are a series of switchbacks because of the steep grade here. And then there's also a set of stairs that you could go down also on the side. And then entering the site, it would still be a seating area that has a bottle filler uh, for water. There's some game tables still and seating. And there's also a circular bench with plantings in front of the existing restrooms. And then moving up, you can see the new five to 12 play area uh, with uh, new uh, units. And then surrounding it, we have kind of a wooden bridge over a plant bed. And then also, uh, I guess, stone paths for different experiences of walking. And then below, we have the two to five play units in this space. And then also connecting it, we have another a bridge into kind of the open space area. And so besides this plant bed area, this area remains pretty flat. The blue is actually just color seal coat. So it's coloring over the surface. And then we have new picnic tables here. And then along this wall would be a chalk wall with some animal art uh, picture, uh, already on. And then these little ones here are small picnic tables for children. So their size is smaller. So this space would kind of be an intergenerational play area and an open space area. And then this is the new spray shower area. And there's benches along the side. It's mostly uh, water elements so that the space when it's not uh, summer and turned on, it basically becomes an extended open space area. And then capping off at the very end of the park, this is the new relocated swings, and it's still located next to uh, the edge so that you can swing into the waters. And then the end uh, is a planting area. So let's look at the specific elements within this design. And this is a mock-up of the play equipment. So the colors uh, will have it very naturalistic in tones of uh, green. And then the ground plane will be more tans and with some accents of blue. So this is a two to five. There is an accessible ramp that will take all children into the play space. There's a slide here and different uh, ground play elements that are usable by all children. And then there's another play structure here with a little table for imaginative play. And then we have some balance beams and rope. And also this is uh, called a cozy dome. So if some kids want a more quiet space, they can crawl under and stay inside the space. And then another angle of this play equipment And this is the five to 12 play equipment. So it would be in the same color scheme as the two to five, but it goes higher up. We do have an accessible ramp that brings all children in with different play elements within. You can see kind of these ground play elements that can be used by all kids. There's different ways to go into uh, the play structure um, and you can see there's different slides also within this uh, uh, unit. There's some climbing structures here and then a rope play. The next picture should show it a little better. So we have kind of a curved uh, slide, a twisty slide. We have a lot of climbing structures within it. And 
then different ways to try to go up or sideways. Okay. And then for the swings, we've I've included some different ones that we've had. So, so there's more bigger kids swings, the flat straps. There's also a universal swing so that all kids can use them. And then there's also this type that we're using now. It's called a tandem swing. And so you can see in this picture, a caretaker and a child can sit face to face and swing together. And then we've kept the bucket seats here too. Uh, for spray shower, they're mostly ground elements that spray water into different kind of heights. So for smaller kids, generally the lower ground spray ones are a little better. And then for bigger kids, they might want a little bit more power on the water. So we have some taller ones too mixed in and some directional ones. So they'll go to the side. And then these are other play features I've mentioned. So there's kind of a bridge over planting areas and then stepping stones. So different experiences of uh, feel for the feet and then this chalk walk um, feature. Uh, I wanna mention what's existing for fences. We had a low two feet one and then surrounding the site is seven feet. Uh, to increase better sight lines, we're gonna lower part of the seven feet where it's, it's more visible going into the site. So it'd be four feet. And then within the site, there's only a few fences, three feet more so kids don't run into the swing area directly. And then to protect the plantings at the end, there's a fence remaining there. And then the accessible ramp that I've mentioned has handrails around. These are the site furnishings that we'll have on, on this project. So we have some hex, uh, hex block pavers, some colored concrete, and this is a kind of a green tone and a tan. We have the color seal coat for livening up the open space area. We have two different types of drinking fountains. We have the accessible and child bowl that's further into kind of the play area. And then in the adult seating area, we have the bottle filler with the high-low and then the fencing that I've mentioned before. Uh, these are kind of typical ones. The ones that I mentioned is the circular bench here and then the small children's picnic table. Uh, for the plants, we have pretty hardy plants that are known to survive well. So it's a limited palette so that um, there will be less maintenance required. And then kind of a perspective to show kind of the chalk wall with the existing, um, currently this is just mocked up with the existing um, art animals, but it would be in the open play space next to the picnic tables, the wall would be a chalk wall and then there would be different animal uh, graphics on top. So I envision new animals to be designed, but for sake of our discussion, these are the existing ones replicated. Um, and then just showing like a different part of the site, we have the swings here with the different types. And then in relation to the small picnic tables and the big picnic tables. And then it's the design. So I'm happy to take any questions or any clarifications needed. Okay, before I open it up for questions, can you just, uh, what what's the, the swings? There's four strap, one tandem, two regular bucket, and then what's the green one? That's, that's a- uh, that's We call it a universal uh, swing. Okay. Um, so before I take questions from the, Committee, I'm going to go to the public. And before I ask the public, um, rather than going in the order in which people have raised hands, I'm going to ask, is there, are there any children, actual children on this call right now? Not parents of children, but children. Yes. Okay. I would like to hear from that child, what he or she or they, I don't know who's on, what they think. If 
he or she or they are comfortable sharing their views because this is after all a playground and uh, it's designed for kids. So at the risk of putting you totally on the spot, uh, what do you think? Well, guys, you're on. You wanna introduce yourselves? Introduce yourselves. Introduce yourselves. Leo, now, introduce yourself. Well, one of you has to speak or we lose our turn. So go now. Okay. Is there someone named Leo? What do you like about the design and what are you really hoping for? Um, monkey bars, where they have the flagpole of all sizes and kinds. And how many times do you go to Lily Brown every week? Can you say that out loud? You have to answer. I can't. Four or five times I go there every week. Wow. Okay, so so let me ask you: uh, Is your name Leo? Did I get that yeah. right? Yeah. So Leo, you were you were listening to Cecilia Cho's presentation and hopefully seeing some of the pictures of the proposed design that she was showing. Um, I'm sorry that I, I don't have you on uh, camera. Oh, wait, you know what? Do you mind if I promote you guys to a panelist so that we- That's, That'd be great. <laughs> okay, fantastic. You can see you. Hang on a moment. Did that work? Excellent. But now you're gonna have to turn on your video. Okay, guys. You're Excellent. <laughs> All right. So tell us what you thought. What do you like? Um, the swings. And what do you like about the climbing structure for the five to 12 year olds? Um, yeah. Well, what do you like? You said some things were really cool um, and also. So you both like this climbing wave over here. Yeah. What was the thing that you were, you both said something at the same time. You were looking for, you saw the swinging rings, but I need some feedback from you. Or I'm, Monkey bars. So say it out loud. Say Monkey bars. Monkey bars. And what do you we describe as a monkey bar, Hannah? Can you, can you describe for Cecilia Cho? Does it look like a ladder? Sort of like a ladder that you can swing. Okay. We can definitely look into, uh, yeah, we've got the overhead rings, which are a similar type of play, um, but this Let's is far from set in stone. We can look at um, including monkey bars, I believe. Yeah. Yeah, yeah we can we definitely just started jumping it. up and down, which was not really. Hot, um, <laughs> you know, guys, can we uh, jump close to the camera? We we oh, aim to please. Yeah, we have we have absolutely. Yeah, I can definitely put in the ones that go over. Yeah, we can, we can do that, especially with the excitement. <laughs> okay, well, thank you so much for the opportunity to provide some feedback. They were really excited about the first round, and so were most of the kids in our building. And I have to say, Lily Brown was part of what kept us sane during the pandemic. So we are, uh, we are. these kids grew up here. This guy used to sleep in the bucket seats. So, uh, you know, we are, we are like, we are lifers. That's Excellent. great. Well, Excellent. thank you so much. I support the monkey bars. It was a great idea, by the way. Monkey bars, 100%. We're on it. I think what it, what it to, to me, and I'm just going to chime in watching my daughter now turn eight, is that what I, I'm really appreciating is the thoughtfulness of keeping this a fun place for kids who are older because they don't have enough freedom to go places by themselves. They still love to play. So mm -hmm. it's really nice that you took that into consideration. Um, so really just thanks a lot for making this a community process. And, um, you know, we're, we're excited to see the changes. And um, thanks for, Leo, can you say thank you for having had the opportunity to speak? Thank you. Well, thank you for your braveness and stepping up.
All right, uh, I'm seeing a couple of other questions from folks in the community. I've got a question from Dan Somer. Uh, so I'm gonna put you on, uh, ask you to unmute. I did, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you now. Hi, uh, first of all, let me just sort of say, uh, I I've lived here a short period of time, four years compared to a lot of people. And the Lily Brown playground area is really a central location for this community. It is vital because if you could do me a favor, I think it's around slide 18 or 19, showed the streets down to 158th Street. Mm -hmm. So what happens, what I'm concerned about, we didn't discuss in this particular uh, session, but I heard in other sessions, that it would take two years to do this project. Once it, the construction started, it would take two years. If that's true, if that's still true, that timeline, that's a great concern because imagine uh, parents with uh, strollers, if they're at a, if you can go to, it well, was a bigger- uh, no, It no, will no. be one one year of construction just, just to set the right, uh, uh, so we're talking about the right duration here. But okay, that's that's changed because I heard two two that, that two Actually, years. Go I'm ahead. gonna I'm gonna jump in here. So when Parks talks about timelines, there's a timeline for design, and right. that's now, and then there's a timeline for uh, procurement for procurement where they are letting the contracts and getting the bids and mm -hmm. firming everything up, and then there's the actual construction. There are very few, pro most projects are slated at the outside for 18 months, and many of them are slated for 12 months, sometimes even less. But the reason why, if someone had said it's going to be two years or two and a half years or whatever until it's finished, that's because it included the time frame for the, um, the procurement. And during awesome. procurement, there's no, they haven't broken ground yet. And whatever is available now is still available for use. I understand what you're saying. So let's talk a year, okay, from the start of construction. My concern is people from 163rd Street down to 100, you know, they have to go to Upper Riverside Drive down to 158th Street, go down to the park, and we all know that to steep hill, and then going over the highway, right, mm -hmm. and then down the ramp uh, into Riverside Park to get to the next closest. Uh, no, no I'm, I'm seeing Tracy shake her head. No, if I, if there's a closer one, please let me know because I was very concerned about families having to go all the way you down gotta, to Riverside you Park. You gotta take yourself off of mute, Tracy. I'm off mute. Okay. We got Adventure Park right on 164th and Edgecombe. That's three avenues and a block and a half up. And that Thank park you. is great. You also have, if you, again, walk across 162nd Street, three avenues to Edgecombe, you could go down to 155th Street and hit that park there. But the Adventure Park is three avenues and a block and a half up. Okay. And it's big. And we just had a presentation on it. And there's also and there's also Wright Brothers. Uh, that's the one over by 155th Street. Um, I, I do I do want to. I mean, to your point, Dan, you are absolutely right that the reality is when it's your closest playground and it is closed for construction, there's kind of no way, no polite way to put this. It sucks because your neighborhood playground is closed. But the reality is there is no way to renovate anything without closing sure. it. We don't like it when the elevators get taken out on the A train. We don't like it when bridges and streets are closed for infrastructure development. We don't like it when libraries and playgrounds are closed so that they can be fixed. Um, but we like the changes that happen when these um, changes are made. So. Okay. I, I appreciate your point, but I do think um, 
the short walk, additional walk that people will have to do uh, will be well worth the benefit of this uh, excellently improved playground. Yeah, this playground is really just yes. a community hub. It is such a wonderful thing to hear all night long almost children squealing with laughter and pleasure. It, yeah. It's it's really what it's, New York City is all about. Great. Um, I do want I do want to be mindful of time because we have yes, go right ahead. Thank uh, you very much for explaining to me the other locations. You bet. Um, I want to before I go back through the committee. I want to recognize that further back in the chat. Uh, Maria Luna, member of the public and former esteemed member of this board, uh, talked asked about lights in surrounding areas, crossing signs on Riverside Drive, um, and also the area for displaying or announcing community events. So is there, I love the chalk wall, that's fantastic, but is there some place in the park design that includes some kind of bulletin board or some kind of something like that. I think we would need to look further into that. And I know we did receive that comment. I think we've got some further research in terms of what um, what the borough staff would be comfortable uh, supporting. Um, it's definitely uh, something we should take away from this meeting to continue to look into. OK, so thank and, you. And, uh, uh, are there going to be any changes to lighting and is there going to be any particular thought given to um, crossing signage if indeed that is uh, deemed necessary and appropriate? I take Maria's point regarding public safety. Mm -hmm. The site itself, the new accessible ramp and within the park, there will be new lighting. In terms of crosswalk, that part is actually outside of my um outside of our limits and it's technically outside of parks jurisdiction also but okay. It, yeah okay um all right uh alexis you have a question yes first of all thank you this is a wonderful presentation um just curious why uh what are the reasons that the newly paved ramp uh, cannot be accessible. Uh, this ramp, this no, the one um, where it says newly paved ramp not accessible. This one is um, it's a bit yeah, too the slopes, steep. Uh, exceed, oh, we, okay. So in order to make that one accessible, we probably have to do switchbacks into what we know is a very popular sledding hill. Uh, and our mandate really was when we redo a park, we make it accessible. Um, so having achieved that with a minimal impact on the landscape, uh, that is where we drew the line, especially gotcha. considering our budget as well. So gotcha. Yeah. And then just qu another one, quick one. Um, I know the plans don't include upgrades to the restrooms, but when were the existing restrooms last upgraded and are they ADA accessible? So the existing bathrooms are currently not ex ADA accessible because of the width of the doors, technically. Um, this project will raise the grade on the entrance into the bathroom. Um, and I believe these were done in 2001. Oh, so they really need. Yeah, uh, a future project would be uh, probably a good idea to renovate those. It's it's uh, not within our capability to address that at this time with this with this project, but it's a it's on our radar as one to do. Uh, it's really because, important that the bathrooms are accessible. I think. Yeah, the 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 width. Yeah, we, the what we can do bringing it flush to grade will allow some people with different uh, you know, mobility issues to get in, but we know it's not all the way there. Yeah. Thank okay, you. So just, just to be clear, um, so in terms of process, you need a resolution on this. Um, yes. All right, I, I, I would love to talk more about this, but I really wanna get to the EDC presentation um, mm -hmm. and not have this meeting go past like 9.30, which is, the three hour meeting. Um, so, and there's there's uh, some comments uh, from um, uh, from Babette, the parents of, of Hannah and uh, Leo, who uh, think that the chalkboard is exciting. Um, they're concerned about bad words. 
uh, I agree that if that happens, you can totally erase them or draw over them. Um, and she also appreciates saving the um, um, the sledding hill. Uh, that's that's Hannah's contribution, uh, quite understandably. Great. So in terms of a resolution, I need everybody who is on the committee to please turn their screens on uh, because we have to capture voting for posterity. Um, I, I, yeah, I understand Alexis is not able to put her screen on because her screen is not working. You get, you get a pass on that. Um, Thanks, pal. Uh, no worries, no worries. Um, so Justin, as, as anybody who has ever attended my meetings knows, I loathe group writing exercises. So what I do is I just make sure that we have consensus around what are the required components of this reso. It will include a bunch of whereases which address the current conditions, which talk about the that there were, you know, what the public input process was and when the meetings were, that notes how much the funding is and where it's coming from, that talks about the timeline. Uh, remind me, what's the, what's, what's the timeline in terms of conclusion of design, uh, the beginning of procurement and the proposed groundbreaking in an ideal world? Um, so it would be, uh... January of next year, right, for the completion of design, because it's a one year design duration, then uh, 12 months of procurement, and then 12 months of construction. Okay, so you're talking about ideally design ending in December of this year, procurement going January of 24 to December of 24, uh, groundbreaking in theory of January of 25, and the playground opening in December of 25, which is a weird time to open a playground, but I'll take it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. That's right. Because nothing, nothing says happy Christmas and uh, and happy Hanukkah like a brand new playground. I love <laughs> that. Um, okay. So those things would all go into the whereas as there would be, um, you know, the fact that you made this presentation um, and we would capture some of the main design elements and then our recommendation, since I'm not hearing any objection or really any suggested improvements other than looking into um, the possible addition of some kind of signage. If you, look, if you look at the little board that's posted in like Bennett Park, it's a very small structure. It's, it's, it's one of them is behind glass and one of them is just a kind of soft board that you can put um, uh, push pins or thumbtacks in. And it's the size of like four, eight and a half by 11 pieces of paper. These sorts of things tend to be very, very popular and helpful in a community playground. So if there's some way you can you can do that. Uh, mm -hmm. I assume there will still be the usual Parks Department standard issue signage that gives some historical information about who Lily Brown was. She was an educator, uh, a longtime area resident for, resident for people who do not know that. Um, so there would be, uh, uh, the, the, the be it resolved would be like, we love this and yes, please, and thank you. Sound about right, everybody? Okay, so all in favor, either uh, give me a thumbs up, say yes, or uh, activate your raised hand feature. So that's Danny, Luana, Daryl, Domingo, uh, Mancita. I vote yes. Uh, Naima, are you still here? Uh, Alexis, uh, can somebody, I think Naima may have stepped away. Danny, can you shoot her a text so that we can get her vote on record? So that's one, two, three, four, five, six. Anybody on the committee that I didn't capture? 
Okay, so it's unanimous with six, possibly a seventh to come in. And other members of the board, we got Tracy, how do you vote? Tracy says yes. Are there any other members of the board on the call whose vote I did not capture? Okay, so it's gonna be unanimous with either six or seven votes, depending on if we hear back from, um, from um, Naima, if she just goes on camera and registers that. And, oh, Jody Herson, yes. Jody, I'm so sorry, you are a new member and I did not promote you to panelist because I did not see that you are here. That's my fault, Liz. No worries. And Steve, I'm going to promote you to panelist also, although I know that you cannot vote on this by virtue of your position at the Parks Department. Jody, how do you vote? I vote yes. Absolutely yes. And I love the design. Excellent. Uh, it, to be clear, Jody lives near uh, near Lily Brown. So I, I feel like, you know, we're I all just vote with whatever Leo and Hannah say. Well, there you go. Soon to be soon to be members of Community Board Twelve in about uh, <laughs> exactly. Uh, she's eight, so eight years because sixteen is the minimum. Okay, um, uh, uh, Liz. Yes, Steve. Yeah, we we we, uh, we may have added some money to this budget. I'll have to get back to you. Uh, uh, the uh, the number that we're showing uh, may not be up to date. Okay, if you could let me know, because uh, right now I'm showing three point seven five. So yeah. just. So everybody knows that number will uh, may be revised to reflect uh, whatever it will be revised to reflect whatever is the actual funding, if indeed it is more than the 3.75 uh, million. Yeah, I think um, we have to add money to create the accessible path from the upper drive. Got it. Okay. Well, this is outstanding. Uh, thank you all. I really appreciate it. And I'm just gonna do a quick check in the Q&A. Um, uh, there was a quick question about the west ramp, west ramp curb. This will be a new curb on this side. This uh, Because yeah. it's currently very splotchy and uneven. Okay. I also saw a question uh, about concern for the space for adults that I could address quickly. Um, we did get feedback asking specifically for that. And also wherever we have a bathroom, uh, adults are allowed in to use it. So um, with that being the the case, we tried to make it very clear where adults are welcome using the pavers, right? So you can kind of very clearly see that that's more of an adult treatment and then everything else is safety surface. You really clearly have an idea that now you're in a kid area. So that's really the um, the best answer I can I have for that um, concern, which is understandable. And 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 Liz, when you when you do your uh, your next round of uh, budget requests, you might want to include uh, the renovation of these. Yes, Th yes. Thank you for reminding me of that. I I I actually wrote that down elsewhere in my notes. That would be another uh, another whereas. Um, let me just make sure I have that in the minutes. Um, But when you do your list in October, you might want to put this on. Right. So the Rezo will also include uh, an additional whereas regarding the general desirability of ADA compliant restrooms. And there would be a be it further resolved that would call on, you know, the people who control the capital uh, budget to um, highly prioritize funding a um, a, a, an additional project outside of this, uh, after this, to um, reconstruct the bathroom and make it uh, fully accessible. That's a pretty common thing when we do um, uh, resolutions regarding playgrounds, because we're all about bathrooms. Is everybody good with that addition? Okay, cool.
Okay. So running a little bit behind, but um, you know, I don't want to save the best. I don't want to say we saved the best for last because everything has been really fabulous so far. Um, thank you to everybody who has presented. And now I would like to introduce um, Tara Das and the EDC team to give us some information on sort of a high level view and summary of what the design concept is going to look like for the Academy Street and North Cove uh, proposed new playgrounds. Um, Fernando, you're looking very, very dark and backlit. You are literally a shadow of your, ah, you have a face. <laughs> Lovely. So nice to see your Shana Plenum. Um, oh no, I had to, I had to do a three, a 180 rotation. <laughs> fantastic, I get that. Um, and Liz, real quick, can we get Nate Harris and Beth Means? We're promoting Nate Harris, absolutely. What, what is a meeting on this topic without Nate? Uh, and Allison Shipley, of course, we need our design team here. So um, yeah, we had a lot of meetings. We had a lot of walkthroughs. You've, you've had a lot of uh, open portals. You've gathered a lot of data. I'm not expecting to see a plan, but I'd love to know, uh, and we'd all like to know, where are you, where are you heading with this? What can we expect to see? And also talk to us about a timeline. Absolutely. Thank you, Liz. And as Liz mentioned at the beginning of this call, um, uh, for today, we are just presenting on what we've, we've heard, um, a little recap on the extensive community engagement we did over uh, the winter and the spring, um, and at a high level, uh, presenting what we're thinking going forward. But there will certainly be um, moments to return in the fall to discuss this at greater length and hear back from you all. Um, so we have an extensive group from EDC, Parks, and QRP on the line tonight. Um, I'm Tara Das. For folks who don't know me, I'm a government I'm on the government and community relations team at EDC, as is Fernando Ortiz, who many of you know very well. Um, we also have Sima Malik from um, the EDC Capital Team, um, and then from Parks we have Sarah Nielsen, Elizabeth Ernish, uh, Leslie Peoples, and Steve Simon as well. Um, so I will pass it over to. Uh, the QRP team to run us through our presentation, but I first and foremost want to thank the community board, the council member, and everyone who has shown up to um, take surveys, attend our public meetings, um, and it's been super wonderful to see the responses um, from so many people in the community. You're hard to hear, Nate. Sorry, guys. We're not able to hear you. Um, yeah, Aaron, you might want to check your audio. Um, if you're if you're having difficulty getting your audio to work, you might consider killing your audio input on your video. On you might consider calling in on your smartphone, enabling the audio on that connection, and disabling the audio input on whatever is your your computer connection that's providing the video feed. It'll be a little weird for you, kind of like singing the national anthem at a football game, because there'll be a bit of a delay, but we'll be able to hear you, which we cannot now. Allison, are you able to hear us? Hi, this is Allison. Can you hear me? Yes, we can, we can hear, hear you. you loud and clear. Okay, 
maybe we'll just do it from over here. Hold on. And Mercury's not in retrograde yet. This, yeah, this, this week has been a funny, last two weeks have been funny. Okay. Thank you, Fernando. <laughs> uh, we, can't, we can't hear Nate, uh, but we can hear Allison, or we could hear Allison. The joys of tech. And we can see the screen share. Hey, everybody. Now we can hear you. Hi. <laughs> oh, sorry. Presentation bigger, though. That would be great. Sure, we will. Uh, technology issues. Sorry about that. That's okay. Um, so, Allison, will, um, can you enlarge the screen, Allison? From, it's not over here. It's in there. <clears throat> So uh, thank you everybody so much for having us on this packed night of your agenda. My gosh, um, we really appreciate it. And so we have two goals tonight. We want to report back to you on the community input process that we've been engaging on for the past uh, three plus months. <clears throat> and we also want to share uh, concept bubble diagrams with you uh, that are the result of this input process. So Allison's going to expand our screen here. Hold on one sec. Yes, okay, so we're talking about two new waterfront parks tonight, uh, Academy Street um, and North Cove. And some of the local landmarks here are Dykeman Houses. We have the Con Ed plant, uh, and this is 201st Street here that, that ends at the Harlem River. And then up at North Cove, we have the MTA uh, rail yard site. So go ahead, Allison. Okay, so just a little context for nearby parks. Uh, we have Sherman Creek uh, to the south of Academy Street, High Bridge, of course and then a small playground, Dykeman Park, uh, Monsignor Cat. And those are the only parks within a five minute walking radius of our new sites. So just Nate, a little, uh, yeah. Are you are you able to make the presentation a little larger? And sorry to interrupt. Oh, sure, Fernando. Um, Allison, could you do a full screen? Okay. Sorry, guys. Um, or maybe just try to zoom. You currently have it at 75. Maybe if you zoom in a little bit. Yeah, okay, we'll do that. Um, so just a little extra context here for uh, these two parks. Uh, they're going to be the North and South anchors for a future waterfront esplanade all along uh, this part of the Harlem River in Inwood. Okay, um, so Allison's gonna try to blow it up here. Um, the sites do experience flooding, so we're taking that into account in all of our planning. So just a couple existing conditions photos of the site. So this is Academy Street. So we're talking about the former uh, roadway uh, that's being demapped and the top right, uh, sorry, left hand image is from 10th Avenue looking down 201st Street. And our new site is on the right. So uh, that's an image looking within the site. That's the old roadway. And then some images, uh, the waterfront views. Okay, and this is up to North Cove. So what you're seeing here, it's currently a parking lot when you enter the site. And then you, as you walk through the site, you enter uh, you see this kind of tree line cove uh, with really beautiful views out to the water in the Bronx in the distance. Okay, so we have done a number of community outreach events that we wanted to report back to you on. Uh, so in January and February, we met with uh, elected officials, especially uh, Council Member De La Rosa and CB12. 
And then uh, March 15th, we had a virtual community input meeting. March 18th, we had a site walkthrough. Uh, March 23rd, we had an in-person meeting at the Dykeman Senior Center. Uh, and then in April, we had <laughs> many, many events, sorry. Um, in April, we had a tabling event at the uh, NYRP Easter Egg Hunt in Sherman Creek. And then April 16th, we tabled outside of the Dykeman Street subway station. Uh, April 24th, we had another in-person meeting in the evening at PS5. And then on May 4th, we had an uh, in-person event uh, with PS5 students, uh, fourth graders. And throughout this whole process, which was completely uh, in bilingual in English and Spanish, um, we had uh, online input op opportunities as well as uh, we distributed in-person questionnaires and we received 300 responses to these questionnaires, which I'm gonna tell you about next. So this is to point out some demographics from the questionnaire. Uh, most of the respondents were between 25 to 39 or 40 to 64, but we did make a concerted effort to reach out to seniors and youth. And the vast majority of respondents, oh, just one more thing, uh, were from the neighborhood from uh, zip codes 10034 and 10040. <clears throat> Go ahead. So uh, this was the Academy Street specific responses to the questionnaire. And on the top left, you see uh, some amenities that people desired. So out of you know over 200 responses, people wanted a lot of park amenities that you see at a lot of places like seating, walking paths, drinking fountains, lighting. But people also were interested in water access and picnic spaces, water play, uh, playground, um, barbecue, event spaces, and then it kind of trails off down to some fishing interest. Um, and then also people just wanted to, some typical uses, be louder, oh, some typical uses, um, uh, you know, running and walking and play, but also people are interested in kayaking, bird watching is really, was really popular, picnicking and barbecuing. Um, and people were interested in lots of natural features. You can see this um, pie chart on the top. And then major concerns were safety uh, and trash and cleanliness. So for North Cove, um, there were some similar uh, desires for a lot of part I mean, as you see in a lot of parks, like seating, walking paths, lighting. People were again interested in water access and picnicking. Um, there was kind of a less uh, interest in barbecues at this site, uh, more interest in fishing, um, lack, relaxing, walking, running. So all, all that kind of typical park stuff. Um, and then a similar concern for safety and trash and a lot of natural features, trees, waterfront, uh, habitat, et cetera. And I just wanna say before um, we go too much further, we're gonna share all this with you it's a lot of information to digest. Um, so we and we have a slide for each of the input meetings that summarizes the um, feedback we heard. So uh, you know, in the interest of time, since it's you know after eight o'clock, I don't want to spend uh, too much time in detail on each of them. But just to point out, at the virtual session, um, amenities were the most popular requested items. So all kinds of park amenities like seating, shade, trash cans, barbecue areas, and picnic were the most popular. Um, at our site walkthrough, again, those amenities like barbecuing and shade, but uh, water-related activities were popular here. A lot of boating uh, advocates showed up to this event. Go ahead. And so at the Senior Center, again, the amenities kept coming up as the most popular item, but here people were interested also in some activities like fishing, biking, fitness, so a lot of active recreation. And safety was also popular. Okay. Okay, so this is the evening meeting at PS5. Uh, here, natural features were the most uh, popular item or desired item. So wetland plantings, habitat preservation, gardens. Uh, again, amenities were popular and event spaces uh, were also a popular request here. Um, these are a couple images from the uh, meeting with uh, PS5 students. So we asked the kids to design um, their dream playgrounds and they came up with some really cute ideas, really fun ideas. Um, 
they're very interested in you know really, really active play like climbing uh, monkey bars uh slides but they were also interested in uh trees and nature um zip lines into the water ice cream <clears throat> And they were thrilled to have their ideas potentially incorporated into the park. Uh, so just as a way of kind of summarizing all of the input, um, this is in descending order. So the most popular features of, from what we heard uh, for Academy Street were picnicking and barbecuing, waterfront access, uh, event spaces, play, and then fitness. And then just general amenities like trees, planting shade that we would incorporate uh, no matter what. And then in North Cove, um, what we really heard was that um, preserving the natural habitat and ecology was really the highest priority at this site. Um, we know there's been a huge long neighborhood involvement, um, especially from people like Jim Cataldi uh, and improving the habitat of this site. So people also wanted to picnic and play and have water access here as well. Okay, so just a couple of precedent ideas um, before we get into our concept bubbles. So. Uh, just, you know, esplanades with trees, um, a lot of planting. Go ahead. Uh, different kinds of edge treatments, such as like uh, esplanade, more esplanade-like treatments or planted edges, um, riprap edges that incorporate seeding potentially, we think would be a really great feature. Uh, a, a large variety of seeding from traditional um, ADA accessible seeding with backs and armrests to informal rock seating and picnic tables with trees. Okay. Um, natural plantings, uh, potentially incorporating you know, rocks, shrubs, um, different layers of vegetation. Um, active recreation and active activities like fishing, water play, and fitness. Okay. So we have two slides left. This is the uh, concept we're sharing for Academy Street tonight. So um, just to kind of overview is there's two main paths through the site, one along the water, which would be like a more, like a wide pedestrian esplanade, and then a path along the back, which would be a, a more bike focused um, uh, bikeway, um, which would connect to larger um, greenways in the neighborhood. So entering the site, we're envisioning you enter into, you know, a plaza with some seating opportunities, um, some a lot of planting, um, and then that would kind of lead you into this picnic area, which we thought would make sense to kind of orient closest to the street, since it might require some, uh, you know, regular trash pickup and everything like that. Um, as you descend kind of deeper into the site. We're envisioning some fitness and play opportunities, kind of where this site bends, kind of the elbow, and then opening onto uh, like an event space um, where there could be performances, um, all kinds of uh, you know events. And then we're envisioning like a, a garden kind of planted area that you could stroll through. Um, we really heard that connecting with nature was really um, a high priority for people throughout the uh, input sessions we've had. So you kind of could stroll through this planted area and then open onto this really dramatic, um, beautiful view up and down the Harlem River. So this would be like a kind of an overlook space, gathering space. And potential. And so this to the north here, it would be a connection to a future greenway. So this is not part of our project, but it would be built in a future phase. Okay, thank you. And um, so this I is got, our. I got a quick yeah. question before you go on to whatever is next. Yes. So, in addition to sending me the deck so that I can take better notes, yes. Uh, are you going to be posting this like on your website, or can I just send it out to all of the um, the committee members or? Because um, it's a good question. Uh, love to does, take in under any circumstances, I, I, but yeah. after like our fourth presentation, <laughs> it rains come a on, little. Liz, come on. This is you know what, what are you talking about? It's um, a little bit of an overload for sure. Yeah, we, we will yeah, understandable. 
we will definitely share the presentation with you, Liz, and you you know you can share it with your committee members and, and chairs, and then um, we will also upload it to our EDC website. You know Great. where we upload all our stuff for the web, the web page for this project. Um, it will be up there as well if 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 folks need to reference it. Fantastic. And I know I, I know there will be some time for Q&A and I didn't want to like step on your presentation. No, 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 not just, at all. I um, just wanted to figure out like how closely <clears throat> do I need to pay attention to this. <laughs> yeah, I mean, again, we really appreciate I mean, I get a crazy packed night and you're breaking for summer recess. So squeezing us on, we appreciate it. Cool. Um, okay, so concept for North Cove. Um, so what you're seeing here uh, is the dead end of Ninth Avenue. And the new residential building to the south of our site, the Matt Equities uh, new apartment building, is going to be building this uh, cul-de-sac on the uh, Ninth Avenue dead end. And to the north of us is the MTA rail yard. So you'd have an entrance to the rail yard um, kind of adjacent to our site. So what we're envisioning here is, again, an entrance plaza seating opportunities with planting um, that kind of leads you into a grove of trees that you could stroll through and then leads you to an overlook, which overlooks the cove. This is a very peaceful, um, quiet spot. We think it'd be a great spot for an overlook. And then we're envisioning um, a lot of planting up against the building because this is going to be a tall building um, to kind of bring down the scale a little bit and make it feel more comfortable. And then there's this kind of wide uh, major path that leads you all the way out to the edge to another overlook, um, which also has really amazing views, especially of the University Heights Bridge, uh, the Bronx, up and down the river. Um, and we would connect to the Esplanade that Mad Equities is building as you know their private development, but it would be a publicly accessible private Esplanade. So that's kind of what you're seeing there um, to the south of our site. And uh, that's the concept. And so just to give you a little brief overview of the timeline. So the pink is where we're at, June, 2023. Um, we've you know, had our winter, spring community stakeholder process, but we're not ending there. Obviously we're coming back to community board in the fall after spending a summer um, really getting into schematic design and hopefully incorporating more of your feedback. And then really starting in 2024, uh, going into detailed schematic or detailed construction documents and hoping to um, start construction in fall 2025. Okay. Um, Hope that wasn't too quick, sorry. No, it's, it's, it's okay. So I'm, I'm sure we have some questions. I've got a couple of things that I wrote down in terms of uh, my own notes um, at the, Academy Street, and you said the Academy Street is an acre and a half and the North Cove is three quarters of an acre. Do I have that right? That's correct, yeah. So on the Academy Street, um, you have a little kidney shaped area for fitness equipment. Um, mm -hmm. I would suggest, because um, we've had lots of projects where there have been like fitness areas and that is a whole design thing unto itself. Um, hmm. We also have, there's a whole movement about how do you use existing park furniture for fitness? So for example, Nancy Bruning's brilliant small book, 101 Things to Do on a Park Bench. And hmm. they're all different kinds of static exercises that you can do on a park bench. So there are ways mm -hmm. of incorporating um, park furniture, whether it's park benches, whether it's um, balustrades or little retaining walls or seating things that can be designed with fitness in mind in a way that it doesn't, it's not just like fitness equipment. This is a relatively small area Yes. And I would, I would encourage you rather than to, because I'm just, my concern from a design perspective is you're going to have this nice thing and there's going to be some weird little piece of fitness equipment that <laughs> serves that purpose, uh -huh. right. but isn't really consistent with the rest of the design. So I would encourage I hear you that. to yes. have 
different kind of multifunctional park furniture that meets those other needs and can also double as a way of getting some appropriate gross motor movement, but that's not single use fitness equipment. Um, I would like to ask about, so I, I hear the, the real call for barbecuing. It's a, it's a recurring theme at many meetings, not just on this topic. And I love the idea that you're including barbecuing, but I am wondering if there is any benefit to having, so there's like a hard scape area at the Western part of the North Cove that used to be like the MTA parking lot. I know that that's gonna be redone as something else, but I'm just wondering, do you, does it make the most sense to have from a tr trash in, trash out, and also from a fire safety overhanging trees, flammable materials, temptation of throwing um, smoldering barbecue uh, <laughs> coals into the water perspective, where you have the barbecuing proposed now, do you really want to do that? or does it make more sense to have it at the other end? I mean, it may, in fact, you may be right. I could be completely wrong on this. I'm just wondering if anybody thought about it from that perspective. And the third question that is partly mine and partly um, from Allegra Legrand who threw this into the Q&A is toilets. I'm not seeing any bathrooms and one of the reasons why we generally don't see bathrooms, and as we heard in the last Lily Brown project, why we don't see um, a reconstructed ADA bathroom there is because there wasn't funding. This is like a $27 million combined project. Mm -hmm. Is it possible that there's some budget in there for uh, toilets. I understand there, yes. there may possibly be an informal agreement that hopefully will be formalized with Matt yes. for public access to the bathrooms, and that solves the North Cove <clears throat> problem at a smaller <clears throat> site, but is there any possibility for bathrooms at the Academy Street site? Yeah, so, okay, just to go back to the barbecuing question, um, we talked to parks, you know, extensively parks, MNO, maintenance operations about this. They really felt strongly about keeping that on Academy Street close to the street, um, as opposed to putting it out, you know, at the end of the Oh, site. yeah, yeah. No, no, no. My question wasn't about Academy Street. My, oh, 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 I see. This is the Academy Street. I thought, no, what are we looking at right now? We're looking at- This is North Cove. This is, yeah. No, my question about moving the barbecue area was not Academy Street. I like where you have it placed. My question is this picture, the North Cove, why is it, shouldn't it be more where that little hovering hand is, not where you so have it now? That's actually not a barbecue at all. That's like a, a tree, like a grove of trees you could wander through, like I a see. planted area. So we, we just felt like it would be better to keep, uh, you know, Barbecuing, it just doesn't maybe seem like the best place for it. Okay. Happy to be um, wrong on this. Yeah. And, but again, we could incorporate a variety of seating. There could be picnic tables here for sure. Okay. Um, maybe not, maybe not dedicated um, barbecue pits. Okay. Um, cool. Yeah. So, bathroom question. Uh, you know, stay tuned for um, more info to come on the Matt, the North Cove site. Um, can't say anything at the moment, but hopefully um, there'll be more news to share like later in the summer. <clears throat> for the Academy Street site, the challenge with that site is there's extensive underground infrastructure all throughout the site. Um, there is DEP sewer outfalls, and that's like a no-go zone for any structure. And that takes up almost mm, maybe a fourth of the site, uh, kind of close to the entrance. So it's that structures can't work there. And then Con Ed, because of the sub uh, substation, uh, you know, has huge underground cables throughout the site, which 
also don't allow for structures. So <laughs> the only area that's really open for any kind of building structure would be the very edge of the of the site along the water where you'd want to have views and have gatherings. So it's a conflict. I know it's a really tough uh, question. Okay. Um, um, that, um, all right. So I want to just uh, go to some of the other questions that we have. We've got Daryl and then Naima. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, Liz. Um, and thanks for the presentation. Um, just real quick, with the timeline, um, could yeah. you maybe walk us through, I think a lot of people would think that it takes two years uh, to do, seems lengthy, um, and especially for something like this, if it were three months earlier and be done at you know the end of spring, early summer, then we could get some more optimum use out of it. Um, you know, point. yeah, I mean, we want to expedite as much as we can, um, but I will say that uh, we're in the concept phase now, and then we have to do a uh, schematic design. And then the next step is to get Army Corps and New York State DEC approvals for this work, uh, in addition to city approvals. So those are really lengthy approval processes. Um, and we're trying to be um, realistic and build in um, from what our experience is, what appropriate um, timeframes are for those. And I mean, we're going to do everything in our power to get them you know, expedited, but we do want to kind of be conservative and realistic. Thank you. And can uh, for the federal part, can the congressman's office be helpful at all? Uh, you know, um, that might be a question for the EDC folks. I have i don't know if there can be much sway there uh, in terms of the Army Corps, but they might know more, more about that than me. Yeah, I'm not sure if, you know, um, I think it's just, you know, standard kind of procedure of review. Um, you know, we can definitely loop in, you know, the Congress members office is aware of this project. We can definitely like flag it to them when when we've started the process to see if they can, you know, speed it up a bit. But it, it typically just tends to be kind of their standard process of, of review. Um, but, you know, always helpful to flag to our electeds when it's on a, on a, on a table that they could be influential. So we, we will definitely keep that in mind. Thank you. Thank you. Um... Naima. Yes, thank you, Liz. Um, my question is actually very light, very simple. I'm curious to know who names uh, these projects or particularly who named this project. And uh, because I'm a lifelong resident of Academy Street and this whole time I thought Academy Street ended on Nagel Avenue. So I'm just, it was just, this was kind of like, uh... <laughs> yeah. Um, what is this? Well, I, I'll just say, and, and maybe if anyone from Parks wants to jump in, this is just a working title, and parks are typically uh, go through a formal naming process. I think with the community board approval or oversight um, when they actually open. So I, sorry to interrupt. Yeah. I think what I'm trying to say is that it's confusing. That's what it is. Can I can I actually jump in here? Academy Street is the street itself as you know it does end where you think it ends but it was originally mapped to go much further out so part yeah. of this project includes something called demapping yeah currently it doesn't look like a street but if you look at city maps it's a street you can't drive on it you can't use it but it's a street. So part of this project and part of that very complicated um, regulatory approvals process includes literally demapping the street, turning it into not a street. So since it's still considered a mapped street, it's called Academy Street because that's its name. That's the name of the street. Hasn't been demapped yet. If you've got thoughts, if we as a committee and as a board have thoughts on what we want to name this park, doesn't have to be Academy Street, but right now that's that's the working. But it's a great question. Understood. All right, thank yeah, you. And that explanation sure. actually makes sense. Yeah, and if, <laughs> if if you visit the site today, you know, 
if you pass where the car wash is, you'll see that there's like a street and there's sidewalks and there's even, a, a, I think, a fire hydrant, right? Um, it's just not a street that has been used for quite some time for pedestrians, right? So that's why there's the perception that the street ends where, where you mentioned. Hey, Naima, you want me to really blow your mind? Yeah, please go ahead. Go ahead. All right. You know, a little further down south of Fort Tryon Park, you know, Cabrini Boulevard? Just west of Cabrini Boulevard is a one block street called Chittenden Avenue. It's oh, I'm familiar with that one, yeah. One block street. Guess what? Chittenden Avenue was originally mapped to go through what is Fort Washington Park and connect up with the Henry Hudson Parkway. That road, that is not a road that exists. It has never been demapped. So it can still be used, the name. <laughs> I mean, technically sure, never gonna happen. But if you look at certain maps of the city, you'll see that street as it, it shows up as connecting with the, the parkway, which of course it does not, anybody knows in reality, it does not, but it was never officially demapped. So part of this project will be demapping Academy Street. Um, and these are the fun facts you can get at this meeting. We are, we are all infrastructure nerds. Um, so there's a, there is a really robust conversation in the chat about um, the need for toilets, um, the importance of toilets, the possibility of composting toilets, which then do not get into a subsurface infrastructure problem. It's almost 9.30, we're all really fried, and this is not a final plan, but I would strongly encourage you to contemplate the possibility of some kind of toilets that work within the infrastructure uh, constraints um, and that do not at yeah. all. So there's that really interesting uh, toilet that got put in or that's getting put in at Fort Washington Playground. Um, mm. I was super excited about uh, in terms of possibly putting into the Dykeman ball fields because it's a really easy way to build a functioning toilet without going through millions of dollars of yeah. plumbing, you know, running three quarters, in the case of the Dykeman ball fields, running, um, you know, three quarters of a mile of plumbing. And in this case, not messing with um, Con Ed subsurface infrastructure. So. Yeah, we hear and, it and um, yeah. yeah. That would be that would be great. And again, okay. I really want to shout out to um, to Allegra and also to um, Babette, Hannah and Leo's mom, uh, for their uh, conversation in the chat uh, in the Q and A about the importance of toilets. Um, yeah, a couple of suggestions about uh, we wish there wish there were rows of swings instead of static benches. Um, some place okay. for, for older kids to go. So that's maybe something to think about. And okay. um, Bob Burnett says, question, there was interest in water access and storage for on-water recreation. Is there any room to accommodate that community interest? Um, I know that looking at your pie chart and your, uh, your little line bar grams, um, mm -hmm actual structures like a boathouse were not the top, top concerns, but I do want to remind you that, you know, there is this history uh, that we saw, you know, in, in mm -hmm. Amy's presentation, uh, all of those boathouses on the Hudson River. If you think the Hudson River had boathouses, the Harlem River had even more because they're much quieter waters. So, this is a very, if you build it, they will yep. come kind of thing. And I would, we've been talking about the need for more um, infrastructure to support human powered craft on the water. 
and that includes both boat put-ins um, and also, you know, racks and boat houses. I understand right. both small areas and you can't do everything for everybody, but there may be a little bit of room for yeah. possibly adding that. Well, let me just, you know, before we go, Allison, could you just jump to the um, concepts? So we, you know, obviously love boating. We want to promote boating as much as we can. But one thing I want to point out to you is the mean low water line on these sites. So, you know, low tide, that's all mud. Um, right. So it doesn't make sense to put a boat ramp anywhere above the mean low water line here. Correct. Um, so at this site, that leaves the one kind of best view. So we didn't want to take that, um, you know, for like a ramp or something like that, which would take away from, you know, everyone else using the site who's not boating. Totally get um, that. And then if you go to North Cove, Allison, so um, yeah, the mean low water here is in blue. So it's yep. that blue dotted line. So again, like, I'm sorry, that's the mean high water line, but this whole thing is a mud flat. So we, you know, we hear you and we do want to obviously promote and um, uh, human power voting as much as possible. So we could try to see what we can do. So uh, just something to possibly think about is if you look at the, if you look at the sign that says riprap edge, stabilized mm -hmm. shorefront protect mm -hmm. land area. If yep. instead of a box that said riprap edge, there were a, you know, pier, that would be, that's past your, 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 uh, mean high watermark there's that part of it is actually water the part where you know the box that's got that says overlook the box that's got seeding and planting that that whole area is a mud flat at low tide but as mm -hmm. you get to the edge of right. the water and if you look at the the box where your little hand is hovering now that's water that's not mud yeah. so yes right put you could put a pier into the water there couldn't really put a boathouse there you'd have to pop it sort of back at the entry plaza i don't know but this is possibly worth additional contemplation you know again okay. you did lots of lots of meetings over the last you know six months and that's been great but i've been sitting in community board meetings for 27 years mm -hmm. and a recurring theme is we need to get into Manhattan as an island and we need to get on and in the water. Right. Yeah, okay, well, I mean, we definitely hear that and um, we will take that back. Cool, I have one other last question. And this came up, if you could flip back to the Academy Street slide. So if you look at the gray area to the west of the Con Ed building, I understand it is outside, <laughs> I understand it is outside I'm, yeah. of the scope. Mm -hmm. I hear that. <laughs> I'm just wondering. Feeling I know what you're gonna say, but yeah. yes, go ahead. Has anybody, you know, when we had that walkthrough, I did ask if it was at all possible to talk to Con Ed about turning a portion of that triangle into a dog run on the thinking that it is a really easy ask for them to say yes to. I understand, again, it's outside of the scope of this project because it is not public property, but the collective advocacy of the Parks mm -hmm. Department and EDC, um, not QRP, but of the <laughs> government agencies involved in this, mm -hmm. in what is it they say? Helping Con Ed get to yes on this? I just feel like I would be remiss in my duties as chair if I didn't put into the public record that this could be a thing. And with your help, 
you might be able to convince them that this is in fact a great idea and they should do it because it's cheap and would yield tremendous dividends in public goodwill. Okay, all right, um, noted. For the record, I have a hamster. I do not have a dog. A hamster run? No, I, I'm not proposing a hamster run. I just, I, I, you know, again, 27 years of going to spending mm -hmm. yeah. hours yeah. and thousands of meetings and people want dog runs and there's no space in either of these things for a dog run, but that, that little triangle only be a dog run. Yeah, I fully People support it. so unhappy. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Are there any other questions here? Um, Liz, I just want to reiterate, we will share this presentation with, with you and your team. Um, we are, you know, aware that you guys are going on summer break. So we wanted to make sure that we presented something to you before then. So thank you and, and, and the committee for, for having us today. Um, you know, feel free to share back any written, uh, feedback via email, uh, to us, um, and then, we will make sure to post this presentation on our EDC webpage, which I think Tara had shared in the chat. Um, so folks can can check it out on, in the next week or so, and the presentation will be up there. Um, but yeah, I'll pass it over to QRP um, or anyone else from Parks that wants to say some final words. Thank you. Yeah, I would just say thank you so much for your time. I know it's, it's late and it's a busy night, but we really, really appreciate it and look forward to coming back to you in the fall. Thank you so much. September meeting is September 12th. So hopefully it will work for, um, for that. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk internally and let you know for sure. Absolutely. Thank you so much. I really appreciate oh, it. Um, Thanks very much. At, Thanks. Thank you. Okay. At this point, I, I don't, I mean, even if there is new business, it's, it's <laughs> So I would really love it if I would absolutely accept a motion to adjourn. To adjourn. Second. Fantastic. So that's a motion by um, by Domingo and a second by Daryl at 939. All those in favor, please click the red button at the lower right. <laughs> That, that, Thank you that, all. That, that, that's still funny. It's still funny. Bye. Good Thank night. Thank you all. Bye. Good night. Thanks all.